The committee will come to order. Good morning. Like many Americans, seniors and those living on fixed incomes have been decimated by President Biden's inflation crisis. The cost of goods and services has risen 17.7%, 17.7, since Joe Biden became president. You can chart the rise in prices starting with his first full month of Joe Biden's presidency and the rapid decline in American standard of living as $5 of pay now buys only $4.25 of goods and services. Yet Democrats in Congress and the Biden White House insist the economy is as healthy as ever. Not only has President Biden's inflation crisis harmed working families, but it has also endangered millions of seniors and those nearing retirement. Right now, 25% of Americans plan to delay their retirement, and 62% of women say they expect to retire later or don't believe they will ever be able to retire because of inflation. Every single day, roughly 10,000 baby boomers reach retirement age. Yet due to the president's cost of living crisis, one in six seniors are considering going back to work. The number one reason they cite is simply lack of money. Seniors who retired before President Biden took office haven't been spared either. Inflation has eroded retirement accounts for even the most diligent saver, savers. For example, a retirement portfolio valued today at $250,000 would buy the same amount of goods as $137,100 in 2000. Make no mistake, the Democrats' reckless spending agenda caused this problem. And now their radical ESG agenda threatens what's left of seniors' retirement. Democrats are trying to enshrine so-called environmental, social, and governance ideology into America's financial system by removing protections for savers in the tax code. This political crusade threatens the 33 trillion Americans have saved for retirement. As a committee, we have responsibility to ensure that tax advantage retirement plans offer security to American seniors and future retirees. The tax code imposes strict requirements on every professional who manages tax advantage retirement plans in order to protect our seniors. The law states that state governments and the private sector must manage these accounts for the exclusive benefit of retirees. This standard has been in place for decades, and it predates rulemaking by the Department of Labor on fiduciary duties. Working families need that protection to prevent Wall Street money managers from putting climate alarmism, alarmism and far-left policies ahead of their retirement security. But over the last couple of years, we've seen the ESG agenda turn into a pressure campaign that allows, in some cases, forces investment advisors to gamble with retirees' nest eggs. According to Bloomberg, investors have pulled back over $280 billion from ESG-targeted stocks since August of last year, and for good reason. According to our staff analysis of the top 20 ESG investment funds, ESG funds performed 18 percentage points worse than the stock market as a whole during the past year. A report on ESG investing produced by the Committee to Unleash Prosperity cites a review published by Boston College in 2020 that found, quote, pension funds with an ESG orientation lag those of non-ESG funds by two basis points per year over a 10-year period, requiring retirement plan managers to invest in ESG funds is reckless and a danger to the system. We have the responsibility to protect as members of the Ways and Means Committee. The Trump administration's Department of Labor issued rules prohibiting Wall Street managers from investing Americans' retirement savings in woke ESG special interest. The purpose of the rules was to remind retirement plan managers of their sole responsibility, 
protect and build retirement security. The Biden administration reversed course with a superseding rule that favors ESG activism and then went as far as to veto a congressional resolution back in March that would have corrected this error. This committee has a duty to ensure that our tax rules support Americans' financial security. We have a responsibility to put the needs of seniors ahead of climate extremists and far-left activists who want to use retirement savings to finance a political agenda. I hope my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will do what's right and join <laughs> us in protecting our seniors. I look forward to today's discussion, and I'm pleased to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Nill, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wish this was a markup. I'd be prepared to call the question. The last two Congresses will be remembered by those who watched carefully historic bipartisan retirement wins that this committee put forward. Many people have asked me how we'd follow those successes or what would be the contours of Secure 3.0. I'm working on it. I certainly never expected this majority would start retirement policy with low broken legislation that is so far outside of our jurisdiction. I'd argue that all policy areas are ripe for bipartisan progress, but especially retirement. And all we are offered here is a manufactured crisis meant to distract the base from the lack of legislating. Contrast that with the fruits of our legislative achievements. Last week, our nation crossed the threshold of 14 million jobs created under Joe Biden. The unemployment rate below 4% for 21 months in a row, the longest stretch in 50 years. Meanwhile, more working age Americans have jobs than they did before the pandemic. Inflation has fallen by 60%, and the economy, remarkably enough, grew by 4.9% last quarter. Our investments in powered workers created the environment that made it possible for the United Auto Workers to secure outstanding contracts that recognize record growth of the big three. Their wage wins, more paid leave, stronger retirement security, and other wins will reverberate throughout our economy and continuing strengthening the job market. None of this happened by accident. It's the result of the growing economy from the bottom up and the middle out, and Democrats have continued to rewrite the playbook, putting American workers and families first and doing away with Republican failed trickle-down economics that reward the wealthy and the well-connected. A key piece of economic security is retirement savings. Democrats will continue to defend the principle and belief of the Social Security retirement system. Retirement policy has also been the focus of my career, as everybody knows. I'm extremely proud of what we've done with the bipartisan work from this committee that made it easier to save. In the SECURE Act, we eliminated outdated barriers, making it easier for small businesses to offer retirement plans and required part-time workers to be included in 401k plans. From these changes, it is estimated that 4 million Americans will now be able to participate in their employer retirement vehicle. Last year, we doubled down on the success with SECURE 2.0, which expanded the saver's credit to the benefit of lower income savers and automatically enrolls eligible workers in those plans. These changes have made serious headway in making it easier for working Americans to save for retirement. Ways and Means Democrats did the right thing for red states and blue states by fighting to include the Butch Lewis Act in the American Rescue Plan. A reminder, when that legislation was on the House floor separately, 30 Republicans voted for it. After a lifetime of playing by the rules and saving for retirement, millions were at risk of losing their hard-earned pensions, and the provisions that came out of this committee saved families in our economy from irreversible harm. Today, 770,000 plans have already been rescued. Two million people tonight will get a good night's sleep because of what we did. While this is welcome progress, there is still a retirement crisis in our country. Half the people that get up and go to work every day in America are not in a qualified retirement plan. About half, half of all working-age households are at risk of being unable to maintain their pre-retirement standard of living. There is work to be done in the retirement space, and the best way to ensure that Americans are saving more is helping them make more. And that's what we should be talking about this morning. Yet here we are, following one of the most productive Congresses in recent history, with now one of the most unproductive. The biggest threats to Americans' retirement security are calls for cuts to Social Security, which have come from two Senate prominent Republicans, and the obsession and the hysteria with friends' issues, which clearly are not part of this committee's jurisdiction. Could you imagine a lifetime of hard work when you're being told by some that you cannot choose how to invest your retirement savings? The public isn't interested in being told what to do by the government. Politicizing retirement policy jeopardizes workers' hard-earned savings, 
And that's the last thing the American people need. We should be focused this morning on enhancing retirement opportunities using the tax code, marrying it to the continued support we have for Social Security, and offering an opportunity for all Americans to save more. We are 22nd in the world in terms of retirement savings. We should be far ahead of countries like Denmark and Iceland as we proceed. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the testimony we're about to hear, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Neal. I will now introduce our witnesses. Preston Rutledge is principal and founder of Rutledge Policy Group LLC and the former Assistant Secretary of Labor for the Employee Benefits Security Administration. We have Jason Isaac is director of Life Powered and is a former member of the Texas State House of Representatives. Marlo Oaks is the state treasurer of Utah. Mason Ballet, Bole, Bole is senior vice president of First Bank and Trust Company. And Brandon Reese is deputy director of corporations and capital markets for the AFL-CIO. Thank you for joining us today. Your written statements will be made part of the hearing record, and you each have five minutes to deliver opening remarks. Mr. Rutledge, you may begin when you are ready. Let's, let's make sure that you have a working microphone. Can you move Mr. Isaac's microphone over to Mr. Rutledge? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to say it quite that way. Uh, <laughs> Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. I'm Preston Rutledge, and I am pleased to provide comments to the committee. My written testimony contains details on the history of the administrative guidance on ESG retirement plan investing. I will just briefly highlight a few points from my statement. The Employee Retirement Income Security Act, ERISA, passed in 1974, requires planned fiduciaries to invest retirement plan assets solely in the interest and for the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to participants. A similar rule, the exclusive benefit rule, is part of the Internal Revenue Code. Over the years, the DOL has grappled with issues related to retirement plan investments that seek to provide collateral benefits, that is, benefits that would be in addition to retirement benefits. The form and formality of the guidance has changed over the years, and so has the collateral benefit terminology, but the fundamental principle of exclusive purpose has remained. Non-economic factors cannot justify accepting lower financial returns or higher investment risk in pursuit of collateral benefits. In the 1990s, questions arose over the use of economically targeted investments, ETIs, often intended to provide both jobs and retirement income. The DOL had become concerned that its early guidance had created a perception that investments in ETIs were not compatible with ERISA. The department issued new guidance in 1994, providing that if an ETI met the standard of a risk return analysis, it would be compatible with ERISA. It later issued an opinion that came to the same conclusion with respect to the inclusion of a socially responsible mutual fund in a plan investment lineup. The DOL replaced the 1994 guidance in 2008, clarifying that consideration of non-economic factors, while allowed, should be rare and, when considered, should be documented to demonstrate compliance with ERISA. The guidance also provided that if two or more investments Alternatives are of equal value to a plan. A fiduciary may choose between the investments based on a non-financial factor. In 2015, the department expressed concern about confusion over collateral investment behaviors, such as ESG investing. New guidance concluded that the fiduciary standards applicable to ESG investing, including the addition of an ESG-themed fund to a planned investment lineup, are no different than the standards applicable to plan investments generally. 
If the prudence and exclusive purpose standards are met, such investments will not violate ERISA, said the DOL. In 2020, the department issued the first ESG regulation that sought formal public comment. The 2020 final rule utilized the terms pecuniary and non-pecuniary to describe financial and non-financial factors for use in a fiduciary's risk return analysis. Now, that terminology derived from a 2014 Supreme Court decision stating that the exclusive purpose of providing retirement benefits under ERISA must be understood to refer to financial benefits such as retirement income and not non-pecuniary factors. The 2020 DOR regulation also banned the selection of an ESG-themed fund as a plan's default uh, investment. Now, a default investment is used by employees that do not make an investment choice. Actually, it's used by the employers because the employees haven't made an investment choice. They default into that. And the DOL was concerned that more protections were needed for plan participants who declined to make an investment choice. In 2021, the DOL engaged in new rulemaking. The DOL expressed concern that the 2020 rule discouraged plan fiduciaries from considering climate change and other ESG factors in investment decisions. The 2022 regulation removed the pecuniary and non-pecuniary terminology and lifted the ban on an ESG-themed fund as the plan's default investment as long as the fund was otherwise prudent. The department stated that fiduciaries may consider climate change and ESG factors, but that the new rule did not change the longstanding principle that ERISA plan fiduciaries may not accept lower returns or higher risks in pursuit of collateral benefits. This committee has always taken a leading role in promoting a strong and stable retirement system. It has provided significant tax subsidies and incentives to establish and operate reliable workplace retirement plans. The administrative guidance over the years has been remarkably consistent in supporting these core goals by making the focus on financial performance of retirement investments paramount. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Isaac. You're now recognized. Thank you, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and members of the committee. I'm Jason Isaac, and I live a high-carbon lifestyle. And I think the rest of the world should too. It's truly where you have economic prosperity and environmental leadership. From 2011 to 2019, I served nearly 200,000 people in the Texas Hill Country as a member of the Texas House of Representatives. During my four times, I primarily served, during my four terms, I primarily served on the Environmental Regulation Committee, the Economic Development Committee, and Energy Resources. And I learned that the United States is a world leader in environmental protection. We've produced pollution nearly 80% over the last five decades. We're number one in the world when it comes to access to clean and safe drinking water. But today, I want to discuss with you the threats that the ESG agenda is posing on American retirement savings and why Congress must and should do everything in its power to stop this overreach in what is supposed to be a free market with fiduciary duty. In just the past year, not one of the largest individual ESG-labeled funds performed better than either the S&P 500 or NASDAQ. Aggregate returns on the top 20 largest ESG-labeled funds were negative 0.2% during the past year, while the S&P 500 and NASDAQ were up 19 and 25% respectively. Concerningly, these ESG-labeled funds have over $170 billion in total assets under management, tossing Americans' hard-earned retirement savings to the wayside in the name of this insane agenda. Now, over the past 10 years, so-called clean energy stocks have significantly underperformed the market as a whole, with the S&P 500 Clean Energy Index returning a mere 4.5% annually compared to 11.5% annual returns for the S&P 500. The ESG bubble in 2020 was a result of low interest rates, government largesse, and investor enthusiasm that wind and solar and similar technologies would soon outpace fossil fuels in the energy marketplace. This past year has shown that enthusiasm to be misplaced. During 2020, I had the opportunity to work on drafting some legislation that would become law in Texas, referred to as Senate Bill 13, 
that I called the Pension Protection Act, and it was modeled after policy based on anti-BDS regarding Israel. I think nearly three dozen states have passed legislation that says if you boycott, divest, or sanction the state of Israel, you're no longer welcome to do business with that state. And so I crafted a bill that said that if you boycott, divest, or sanction fossil fuels, you're no longer welcome to do business with the state of Texas. That bill passed in 2021 with overwhelming bipartisan support in both the Texas House and the Texas Senate and became law, I believe, early June of 2021. And today, the world's largest financial institution, BlackRock, is on the boycott list in Texas and is currently experiencing billions of dollars being divested because they're weaponizing retirement and pension dollars against the best interest, not only of Texas, but of our nation, of our economic prosperity and of our national defense. Again, it had overwhelming bipartisan support. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Oaks. You are now recognized. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you on the impact of ESG on retirement security. Masquerading as a sophisticated, holistic, and enlightened way of creating shareholder value, ESG is, da is a dangerous investment scheme. Proponents of the framework argue ESG is designed to provide investors with more information to make better informed decisions. This is misleading. In truth, ESG has created an uncontrollable impulse to pressure corporations to solve complex global and societal issues. These issues, such as climate, income inequality, guns, and abortion, to name just a few, should be in the purview of a democratically elected government. ESG hijacks corporate governance to advance ideological objectives often divorced from and even detrimental to long-term shareholder value. It opens the door to coercion, bullying, and other forms of compulsion by activist shareholder proponents with little skin in the game. This happens in collusion with and the assistance of the foreign-owned duopoly of ISS and Glass-Lewis. They are joined by large institutional shareholders who manage billions of dollars in state-owned pension funds. The goal of ESG is not better financial performance. It is to force compliance to one view. The ESG trend that has infiltrated our capital markets will undermine our free market system, harm our economy, and erode the retirement security of hardworking Americans. ESG is incompatible with free markets. The E in ESG is focused on pursuing net zero carbon emissions. However, the primary objective is to transform the global economic system. Just ask Christiana Figueres, who oversaw the writing of the Paris Climate Agreement. She said in 2015, the true goal of pursuing climate change initiatives is to abandon the economic model that has been the engine of global growth for 150 years. In fact, a United Nations Commission report in 2018 predictably con concluded, we cannot fight climate change with capitalism. The markets allocate capital to environmental solutions by investing in innovation. However, when politics force an ideological agenda and get enough participants to behave one way, markets stop functioning. The buying and selling of the same security on any given day requires different views about the future or trading will not happen. ESG dangerously moves the market to one view, the perspective of a small group of like-minded individuals that is generally subjective and controversial. Simply put, ESG destroys markets. ESG politicizes financial decisions. Americans put their trust in investment managers to grow their money for important savings goals like retirement, education, and future emergencies. Investment managers have a fiduciary obligation to focus solely on creating returns for investors. In 2022, the Department of Labor foolishly loosened this fiduciary standard. Plan sponsors and investment managers now have a safe harbor to use politically motivated investment strategies in retirement plans as a default option. When a manager tries to achieve a dual purpose, there is the significant risk that returns will suffer or volatility will increase. Indeed, academic researchers surveyed 1,141 primary peer-reviewed papers and 27 meta-reviews meta based on about 1,400 underlying studies published from 2015 to 2020. 
They found a statistically significant negative relationship between ESG investing and investor returns. New federal regulations, proposed regulations, and the regulatory approach to applying existing regulations support activists inserting their ideological agendas through corporate proxy ballots at annual shareholder meetings. Yet many asset managers are supporting shareholder proposals related to ESG issues, such as racial audits and fossil fuel restrictions, even within non-ESG investment vehicles. In the vast majority of cases, these proposals are driving environmental, social, and political agendas that are not aimed at furthering shareholder value. In fact, multiple research studies have shown ESG-related proxy measures often have a detrimental effect on financial returns. In conclusion, ESG represents the greatest threat to our economic engine, which has produced more innovation, wealth, and opportunity than any other economic system in the history of the world. And that is the real problem with ESG. We will either have ESG and the economic coercion, coercion that system ushers in, or we will maintain our economic freedoms. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bole, you are now recognized. I think that mic is not working. Move a mic where he doesn't have to hold it. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and distinguished members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity today. My name is Mason Bole, Senior Vice President and Loan Officer at First Bank and Trust in Perry, Oklahoma. I am testifying today on behalf of the American Bankers Association and the Oklahoma Bankers Association and First Bank and Trust. In our community bank, we have a total assets of $225 million located in my hometown of Perry, Oklahoma. At First Bank and Trust, agriculture, real estate, and consumer real estate loans account for the majority of our lending activities and our primary market is in North Central Oklahoma. Before joining FBNT, I worked as a farm loan officer for the USDA Farm Service Agency on the eastern side of Oklahoma. I am also part of a multi-generational farming operation that includes my brother, father, uncles, and grandfather. As a father of three children who are growing up on a farm and with my wife and I both working for local businesses, I take immense pride in being able to offer you a firsthand, boots-on-the-ground perspective on the wider implications of environmental, social, and governance issues. Our bank, like most banks, is not pro or anti-ESG. We are pro-free market and pro-consumer. Americans are best served when banks can pursue a free market approach to make the lending and investment decisions that are responsive to the needs of their customers, communities, and business plan. Just as a one-size-fits-all policy have repeatedly demonstrated their ineffectiveness in promoting economic and sustainability efforts to define and steer lending and investment for or against ESG factors are also destined to be economically harmful. The governance of banking institutions should remain focused on the risks they manage and be tailored to account for their size, complexity, and the specific norms in which the regions they operate. Attempts to employ banking regulations as a means of indirect lending as other industries, whether to discourage or compel and investment are both unsustainable and detrimental to the economy, consumers, and the principles of a free market. In Oklahoma, community bank banks play a vital role in supplying capital for a diverse array of services, from production agriculture and the logging industry to freeze-dried candy food trucks. These credit decisions hinge on character, capacity, capital, collateral, and conditions. Our policies are established in our boardroom and upheld by all of our staff members. Each bank has the flexibility to either foster or curtail loan growth of their portfolio in any given industry. We firmly hold the belief that local decisions, driven by a precise analysis of risk and reward, should remain uninfluenced by irrelevant politically driven considerations. Attempts to apply ESG in context of retirement accounts is particularly troubling. It's essential to prioritize stability and profitability to attain the retiree's objectives and making decisions based on ESG considerations may not be conducive to achieving long-term financial benefits. Fiduciaries need the 
Fiduciaries need the discretion to respond to the constantly changing financial landscape and the freedom to best represent the factors in which of the wishes of their clients, some of whom, but not all, may like to focus on ESG-related factors. Government mandates imposing ESG principles, though well-intentioned, may not pose, cha may pose challenges for small businesses, including farms and ranches like mine. Adding more environmental regulations and sustainability demands can place significant financial burdens on farmers and ranchers, particularly those who are just beginning or have limited resources. Compliance often necessitates investment in new equipment and technologies, impacting the profitability of operations. Finding a balanced approach is crucial, one that recognizes unique challenges that small businesses face. Instead of ESG regulations, the federal government should be focusing on ways to make sure that farmers have risk management tools at their disposal. For example, passing a strong, improved farm bill while maintaining and strengthening crop insurance will ensure that we have farming and ranching sectors remain viable. Banks have always cared about issues impacting environmental, social, and governance as they relate to their customers, communities, and business model. What is new are regulatory and legislative efforts to intervene in banks' lending and investment decisions by picking and choosing which ESG-related issues that policymakers seek to favor or disfavor. This runs counter to the free principle, free market enterprises that has made the U.S. economy and our banking system the strongest in the world. We should not go down that path. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Reese. You are now recognized. Chair Smith, Ranking Member Neal, and members of the House Ways and Means Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the AFL-CIO. Our message is simple. Congress should not be playing politics with workers' retirement savings. Contrary to some of the testimony that we've just heard, proposals to restrict retirement plans' freedom to invest have more in common with a totalitarian command economy than a free market system. The simple truth is that most Americans are not familiar with ESG investing. They trust their retirement plans to make these decisions, not politicians. And they certainly don't like the idea of the government restricting their ability to invest responsibly. The fact of the matter is that the consideration of ESG factors by retirement plans is already well regulated by the Department of Labor. We urge Congress to focus on genuine retirement income security crises that we face in our nation rather than ESG-related woke hysteria. With the decline of traditional pensions, workers are on their own to save for retirement through defined contribution plans, such as 401k plans. And unlike a pension, these plans shift the burden of saving for retirement, investment risk, and longevity risk onto individual workers. As a result of this shifting of responsibility, most Americans are ill-prepared for retirement. According to the 2020 census, the median account balance for defined contribution plans in IRA accounts is about $30,000. At a prudent 4% withdrawal rate, $30,000 in retirement savings can support just $1,200 in annual spending, or about $100 a month. This is hardly enough for a dignified retirement after a lifetime of work. Of even greater concern, Nearly half of all Americans do not have a retirement plan account or individual savings account at all. For these workers, Social Security is their only form of retirement security. Social Security is our nation's nearly universal pension, and its funding needs can be addressed without benefit cuts. We strongly oppose benefit cuts of any kind, and Congress must strengthen Social Security by getting rid of the cap on taxable earnings for high earners and by expanding benefits. Workers find it hard to save for retirement for a variety of reasons. First and foremost, low wages make it hard to save. We must strengthen the freedom of working people to come together in unions to be able to negotiate with their employers for higher wages and improved retirement benefits. To restore balance to our economy between working people and corporations, we urge Congress to enact the Richard L. Trumka Protecting the Right to Organize or PRO Act. The union difference 
in working people's ability to save for retirement is significant. On average, union workers' weekly earnings are 18% higher than non-union workers. 94% of private sector union workers have access to an employer-sponsored retirement plan, as opposed to only 68% of private sector non-union workers. And two-thirds of private sector union workers have access to a defined benefit plan, compared with only 10% of non-union workers. We must also address the tax code that provides the bulk of retirement saving incentives to the highest earners who are most able to save on their own. We appreciate that the recently enacted Secure 2.0 Act includes a tax credit for low-wage workers' retirement contributions, but tinkering around the edges of the tax code falls short of addressing the retirement income security crisis. The Butch Lewis Act is an example of important legislation that secured the hard-earned pensions of over 750,000 American workers, retirees, and their families, according to the most recent PBGC data. Notably, not one multi-employer plan in the country required special financial assistance because of ESG investing. But we need to do much more, such as updating the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule so that it applies to investment advice that workers receive regarding rollovers of their 401k account balances on retirement. For most workers, this is the single most financial important decision they will make in their lifetime. I'll conclude my remarks by quoting from a recent AFL-CIO Executive Council statement. Pension plans represent the deferred wages of working people and must be invested with prudence and loyalty to provide retirement benefits. The proper stewardship of retirement savings requires the freedom to consider all relevant investment considerations, including ESG risks. Laws and regulations that restrict the ability of retirement plan trustees and asset managers to consider ESG risks contradict their fiduciary duties. Fiduciaries, not politicians, should make these judgments. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. We'll now proceed to the, the question and answer session. Mr. Rutledge, retirement plan assets are invested to maximize retirement security not just because it's a good idea, but because it's the law. Why is it important that retirement plan trustees manage funds for the exclusive benefit of American savers and not for ESG or other non-financial goals? Well, the importance is, over the course of a working person's career, the, the, you've got the contributions a person makes, the deferrals a person makes, but the, but the assets are in a trust for the in-person's working career, and it's the interest earned, the investment return earned on that, that account that makes up a very substantial portion of the amount of money they have when they finally do reach retirement age. The focus needs to be, and has been, I believe, on maximizing investment performance. Regardless of the label of the fund, regardless of the <clears throat> what you might call a particular fund, a good investment professional advising a fiduciary should be able to, and we trust them to be able to, direct them to the best performing investment, the investment with the best potential for return. That's the way you maximize uh, retirement, and that's the way um, the, the subsidies that the Congress has granted the private sector for these plans is, um, is validated. So tax advantage retirement savings represent some of the most significant provisions in the tax code and tens of millions of Americans rely on them to build, build their nest egg. How would this system be threatened if retirement plan managers put ESG considerations above financial considerations? It's, it's, let me put it this way. Regardless of whether you, it's an ESG fund, regardless of whether it's an EIT idea, economically targeted investment, you still have to look at the plant, at the investment and determine whether it's the, the one with the greatest potential for return. It's possible that an ESG investment in a given situation might represent the best opportunity for gain in that situation at that time and place. And if that's the case, the, the rules have always been, the guidance has always been, you go with that investment. But that's the point is that this is a principles-based rule. It's not a, a rule that says you do this or you choose that investment or you don't choose that investment. The principle is maximizing return given the appropriate amount of risk that a plan is, is willing to, to, to uh, endure. Thank you. Mr. Isaac, 
As I noted in my opening remarks, a report on ESG investing produced by the Committee to Unleash Prosperity cites a review published by Boston College in 2020 that found, quote, pension funds with an ESG orientation lag those of non-ESG funds by two basis points per year over a 10-year period. In your estimation, what sort of returns are investors seeing from ESG labeled funds, and, and does this performance indicate that the ESG agenda is aligned with maximizing retirement security? ESG is certainly not aligned with maximizing retirement security or fiduciary principles. These funds have higher fees, they have lower returns. Virtue signaling is proving very expensive to retirees here in this country to the detriment of our national security, to the detriment of our fiscal responsibility, and really to the detriment of fiduciary responsibility and fiduciary duty. So um, going, going to the fees that you mentioned, um, uh, that savers must pay uh, to certain fund managers, how do the Wall Street management fees associated with ESG funds compare to the fees for typical market index funds? You know, they're typically higher, and there's been research and studies that have been published on this that show that, again, virtue signaling is expensive, and so they charge more money just to have a fund labeled ESG, which is interesting to note that you look at some of these ESG funds, some of them contain companies like the China Coal Company that has higher ESG ratings than American companies that just own real estate, that just own assets, maybe that are going to be produced or you'll have oil and gas produced on them. But these funds have, again, China Coal Company is an ESG fund that has a higher rating than American real estate companies. Wow. How are Americans' long-term retirement savings affected? by these ESG management fees, which only line the pockets of Wall Street? Well, you can see just over the last 10 years, they've threatened, they've given up essentially, they could have had 11.5% return, but they've only had a 4.5% return. That's not keeping pace with inflation. So, Mr. Bollet, as you know, we held a successful filled hearing back in March across the state from you in Yukon, Oklahoma. There we heard how the Biden economy has harmed hardworking uh, families, farmers, um, oil and gas producers um, in your state. How do those same folks feel the impact of ESG activism? Thank you for the question, Chairman. Um, across the state of Oklahoma, we appreciate you guys coming uh, and to see actually what was going on on the home front that was very refreshing for the people on Main Street. Um, our, our people, the Main Street, the small towns and bit, small communities, small businesses, um, we're not pro or anti. I did a quick straw poll before I left and asked about uh, local businesses thoughts on ESG and most of the time I had to explain it but after I explained it they said you know we want we want the freedom to choose those things we do not need a ESG mandate for anything on Main Street so what hurdles does the ESG agenda create for your <coughs> bank and its goals of helping small businesses and building the community again uh, congressman I'll go back to any any mandates that are put on small businesses or small banks that we have to implement uh, create a significant financial burden for us. Additional regulations, mandates are tough for us to implement. Thank you. I now recognize Ranking Member Mr. Nill for any questions he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So during my time as mayor of Springfield, a long time ago, I decided in about 1986, I think, to sell all of the city's stocks in South Africa. Do any of you disagree with that as a reasonable policy about an acknowledged apartheid state? I wasn't looking for a Nobel Prize. I didn't even know what ESG was. Nobody was talking about it. I thought it was reasonable policy. And by the way, apparently, according to de Klerk, it prevailed. I don't think that we're lecturing anybody here on what to do. That's certainly not my position. But I don't think that the argument that we're having today should get in the way of us acting on responsible and reasonable policies in the retirement space. So the Butch Lewis Act. If we did not do the Butch Lewis Act, which I said 30 Republicans in the House voted for as a standalone measure, it would have taken down the PBGC. Guaranteed to. So the requests I had from Ohio 
came from business concerns who said because of mergers, acquisitions, and simply outdated policy, their plans were going to be forfeited, which in time would have taken down the entire system. So when we talk about what has been my passion, retirement security in Congress, people struggle to save for retirement. And they play, as Mr. Reese said, by the rules. Their whole lives, they play by the rules. So for strong retirement benefits, people need issues like paid leave. The achievements of the UAW last week in Detroit are historic. Organized labor has made terrific strides this year alone in how to pr improve pay and strengthen workers' retirement futures. A ringing defense of the Social Security system, as pointed out, we should be enhancing benefits there. But I'm proud of what we did with the Butch Lewis Act. It addressed the multi-employer pension plan crisis. Two million people are going to get a better night's sleep because of what we did, including Republican members of this committee who voted for it as a standalone on the floor, even if they didn't vote for it in the American Rescue Package. As of November, the PBC has approved plans that cover 770,000 workers just in the central state's plan, which received a benefit. The Butch Lewis Act is a good example of what Democrats did. It was the right thing for the American people. We should be focusing on retirement plans this morning and how to enhance benefits, including the success we've had with Secure and Secure 2.0. So, Mr. Rees, do you want to discuss some of these achievements and some of the ideas that you outlined earlier about what retirement security ought to look like, given the success of what happened in Detroit during those negotiated settlement issues last week? Uh, yes, sir, and thank you for the question. Uh, the uh, achievements of UAW members in winning higher pay and increased employer contributions to their defined contribution plans are historic, and they show the importance of collective bargaining and freedom of association to secure workers' retirement savings. And if I may uh, commend uh, c Congress and you for your work on the Butch Lewis Act, which saved 750,000 Americans, including 350,000 members of the central states' pension plans. And if I may share just a few states uh, where those retirees reside. The state of Missouri, 28,000 members receive $253 million in annual pension benefits that are secured thanks to the Butch Lewis. Florida, 19,000 members receive $144 million in annual pension benefits. Ohio, 40,000 participants in that plan receive over $360 million in annual retirement benefits. Texas, 22,000 participants receive $162 million in annual pension benefits. And I can go on. You're doing fine. Uh, I also want to point out that as in Secure 2.0, what we did, with, I've been the author of the automatic enrollment plans. I think that's a big deal. Savers match, savers credits. We want to make sure that we can get an opportunity down to people at the lower end of the economic spectrum to save for retirement savings. That should be what we're talking about this morning. I go home, nobody's talking to me about ESG. They're talking about, hey, is Social Security going to be around for me? They're talking to me about what my retirement plan might look like. And that's what the focus of the committee ought to be, our historic responsibility to make sure that security is provided to the American people. Yield back, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Smith is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses as well. I, I appreciate your insight. I hope that uh, we can agree that it is our job to empower consumers. It's uh, our job to empower workers and that uh, certainly we can disagree perhaps on the Bush Lewis Act and what, uh, uh, how, how that came about, how the need came about and, and what the solutions should be. But I, I think this issue is, is uh, far different uh, than uh, perhaps the merits or lack thereof on, on the Butch Lewis Act. I, I believe that uh, we're talking about financial decisions that are made for political purposes, seeking political outcomes, rather than really focusing on, on opportunity. But let, let me just focus a little bit uh, uh, on the testimony of Mr. Bollet. Uh, obviously, uh, you bring an approach to the issue similar to many constituents uh, of my district in, in Nebraska, and uh, uh, you work hard, and 
and full-time job as well as uh, also uh, farming full-time. And so appreciate that your testimony covered the dual concerns of rural banks attempting to make lending decisions for farms and ranches in an ESG environment alongside the issues ESG demands can create directly for farmers and ranchers. So when I meet with producers in my district, what stands out is how much and how well they care for the land because it's their livelihood. That should go without saying. At the same time, many models used by ESG advocates don't adequately reflect advances in how efficiently producers grow crops in terms of land, water, and pesticide use in the 21st century. Over the period from 1948 to 2019, effectively from the end of World War II until now, U.S. ag production has increased by 175%. That's pretty impressive. Over the same period of time, overall agriculture input use grew by just 4% even more impressive. When policies don't reflect that, it can shut American pro uh, producers out of economic opportunity. For example, two years ago, Democrats moved out of this committee a sustainable aviation fuel tax credit, which utilized an outdated United Nations model, which would have likely prevented fuel made from American soybeans from accessing the credit. Many of the same people advocating against American-made biofuels also promote policies which fail to recognize the contributions of American producers in efficiently feeding the world and the reality that people would starve without efficient agriculture production. Mr. Belay, obviously you're an ag producer yourself. Would you mind sharing your perspective on how you and your fellow farmers and ranchers promote efficiency and protect our environment without overreaching ESG policies? You bet. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. So uh, in Oklahoma, we experienced a Dust Bowl of uh, the 30s. Uh, that was a detrimental time for our, our state, for our country. And over time, we figured out that that was not the right way to farm. We had to innovate. We had to implement new technologies that were incentivized and not mandated uh, in the agriculture industry. We implemented no-till, minimum till, cover crops. And, and through that, we have established very healthy soils, um, very productive soils in our state. We've also done the same thing with animal husbandry, again, through voluntary, um, voluntary incentives, not mandates. So again, uh, we, we appreciate the, uh, in agriculture, we don't like to be told what to do, and I don't think any other Americans do either, especially uh, on Main Street. So uh, incentivizing rather than mandating is what we would prefer. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your, your response there, and, and uh Appreciate the earlier criticism of, of a command economy uh, as well. Uh, I just can't help but think that if we focused more on opportunity than outcome, uh, more people would benefit. <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting the uh, demonization of prosperity that we often hear about. Um, it's not a new thing. That argument, uh, that, that criticism has been around for some time. The irony is that our tax code de depends very heavily on prosperity disproportionately so. But what I am even more concerned about is that disagreement and, and dissent is, is characterized in such a way that if you disagree with something, you're a bad person. Not just that you disagree. I mean, we, we could probably have a little uh, disagreement between uh, uh, use of biofuels and, and uh, uh, petroleum right here, but I don't think there's a characterization of that disagreement meaning you're a bad person. I hope that we can elevate this conversation so that we can see more Americans across our country experience prosperity rather than the central government deciding who gets it and who doesn't. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. It's recognized. Well, thank you very much. You know, we're on a countdown to shutdown, uh, not content with having shut down this House of Representatives with no legislative action for an entire three weeks at this time of challenges from at home and abroad. We are going to be four days from a shutdown of all of the government next Monday. We could be acting on this today instead of this nonsense, tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, but no Speaker Johnson and these Republicans have decided to delay it until the very eve of the shutdown and are expecting to resolve with the Senate all differences on some bill they have not laid out until at the earliest Monday and maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday of next week. And so instead of dealing with that crisis, what we're dealing with today is wokeness. Now, they don't, as the hearing notice says, they don't really know what it means to be woke, 
but it sounds a little black, and it really appeals to the white nationalists that uh, support uh, as part of the coalition that support Republicans, people that object to those who might be adopting policies to overcome historic injustices to people of color. Well, before it's too late, I think we need the Republicans to get woke and to wake up to reality. And that reality concerns the dangers of a government shutdown, the harm it will cause, and it also relates to the outrageous interference that is being proposed here today, just as it has across the country, in basic business decisions of responsible corporations. And I'll ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to include in our record the 2023 State House report, right-wing attacks on the freedom to invest responsibly falter in legislatures, uh, and uh, another paper from Wharton, Gas, Guns, and Government's Financial Cost of Anti-ESG Policies. Without objection, so ordered. And turning to the first of those reports, uh, the, uh, this comment, what you have in front of you is probably the most anti-free market bill that you'll see this legislative session. A comment from the head of the Arizona Bankers Association. I'm just guessing he's probably not a Democrat. Uh, but bankers across the country have challenged and challenged successfully proposals just like that that are being advanced this morning. The Wharton paper is more meaningful because, as is so often tragically the case, when something really bad is happening, Texas can get out there early and do it better than anybody else. And that's exactly what has happened with regard to these so-called anti-ESG policies. And what is ESG? Well, I expect most Americans know as much about ESG as they do about CRT, which is another phony Republican punching bag that's raised at election time. It is about responsible corporations that consider the environmental consequences, the social consequences, and their governance, corporate accountability, whether corporations are accountable to their shareholders, and whether when shareholders ask questions about things like how much corporate money is being spent in dark investments to promote any ESG policies just like this morning, that the shareholders can find out about it, that the social policies consider the diversity of the workforce and whether the corporation is out there trying to reflect any discrimination policies. But in Texas, we have experience with this. Because as Mr. Isaac pointed out, they were successful in adopting legislation. And what was the effect of that legislation? As reported in this paper, a study, uh, an objective study by one of the board members of the Federal Reserve and a finance professor uh, at uh, Wharton. Well, uh, they point out that the effect is that about five major municipal bond underwriters, all the big names in bankings, left the state. Texas issuers will incur $300 to $500 million in additional interest on the first eight months after enactment of the bill. And if this same process continues, it will cost Texans about $416 million a year in additional borrowing costs. That's the kind of freedom that is being proposed here today. Uh, these uh, policies, this interference with business and basic responsible decisions doesn't protect retirement funds, it costs retirees and local governments. All of this from a group that has gone from denying climate change to obstructing efforts to address climate change and now to trying to reverse action for responsible protection against the overheating of our planet, which any sensible person can see going on around them every day. I yield back. Mr. Kelly is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. This is an interesting uh, conversation. Uh, I'm actually in the private sector, so I'm like you, Mr. Bollet. Uh, in 1971, my father actually started a pension plan for our people because he, always, he said to me, listen, when they retire, they're never, the Social Security is not going to be enough for them to live on, so let's, we're going to institute this. Now, I was 21 at the time, and I couldn't imagine how that would be important. Now I understand it. So when we talk about this, e I'm trying to, what is so big about it? A, in the environmental social governance. So I keep hearing, uh, when we come to the, any of these things and have these discussions, that the average person 
doesn't have any idea how to invest his or her money. They're just not smart enough to do it. So the government has to get involved. And so we have something called ESG because if people aren't going to be environmentally aware, socially aware, and aware of governance, we've got to shove it down their throat. Doesn't, really, doesn't matter what the return on the investment is because that's just too bad. You dumb, stupid people need to understand that we know better than you do. Of course, we're $33 trillion in debt and going higher, but we'll be the ones to advise you on how you should make your investments. This is absolutely insane that we're even having this conversation. As far as Butch Lewis is concerned, I absolutely agree with it. And it was really great the taxpayers bailed out the Butch Lewis Fund and put in charge the same people who bankrupted to watch it going forward. Good, good, good move, good move. Uh, as far as the UAW, I'm a Chevrolet dealer. I understand about how cars are built. I understand the importance of having great labor. I understand of it making sure they're, that they're compensated. I'm, I agree with all that. I agree with all that. That's not the problem. The problem today is how are we telling people how they should invest their money and where they should invest their money because actually it just doesn't pan out when you look at the actual figures. Mr. Bully, if you can, just please try to explain the dual role that you have as a farmer, as a rancher, and what you're doing, and also as a banker, and your responsibility to those people who put money into your bank. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so in our bank, whenever people come in and want to invest, we uh, provide the basic services and let them choose what they want to do with their money. It is not, uh, we don't try and direct them in any specific uh, form. We try and talk to them about their goals of when they would like to retrieve their money back or when they think they're going to retire. Same on the farming and ranching uh, community. Our community, uh, particularly my family, my great-grandfather had the first rubber tired tractor in Noble County. Uh, so innovation is not anything new. Um, and we look at, look at these practices and try and help guide our producers, our farmers and ranchers in, in ways that would make them more profitable. Um, a lot of the science and technology is new, so jumping in feet first isn't always the best option. You want to read and make sure it's correct before we go and try and move a tremendous amount of acres to those types of farming and ranching practices. Yeah, but again, you're, you're, you're looking forward to things that are best. I, I, I just don't like uh, a company that's run so poorly as this government is, is people t telling you how you should invest your money. Mr. Isaac, you really hit on some things that I thought were really important. You talked about China a little bit, so I think it's really great that we are able to put ourselves out of business and put them in, in better business uh, mode. T tell me about the effect it's having on us. Yeah, we are. We're actually having companies that are pulling funds out of American companies and they're putting them into Chinese companies. You look at BlackRock Investments and companies like Evergrande, and uh, Country Garden, these two real estate ventures that have, BlackRock has about a 3.5% share. Now, I, I use BlackRock because they're investing in these Chinese-based companies. They have the right to do that because they've partnered with the CCP right. to do that. And they're taking American pension dollars, people that are planning and counting on that for a retirement. And both of those massive Chinese real estate companies are failing right before our eyes. And the detriment and the threat is to those retirees' pensions and losing their money and losing their investment that they're planning on for when they retire to the benefit of China and to the detriment of the United States. So for most investors, I know there's sophisticated investors out there. They're able to do these things on their own every day. But really, when we have people overlooking these funds and people are making decisions for us, the fiduciary responsibility to do it, and then looking at this ESG and trying to understand where does that fit in in the long-range investment of people who put their hard-earned dollars into a fund so at the end of their, of their time of working, there would be something there. I, 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 don't, I just don't see it. Maybe, maybe somebody does see it. I don't see it. And I thought the whole purpose of this meeting today was to talk about the actual investments that we were making and people not being able to do it on their own because, quite frankly, they're too busy. And I, I am amazed. I, I keep hearing about how good the economy is doing. I think people need to let the American people know that the economy is going well because where I am, people can't understand it. I do all the shopping for our family because my wife won't go with me. She can't stand to have people tugging me aside and say, hey, get something done. Will you, you guys will let this energy thing get out of our way? And I said, you know, what? elections have consequences, so God bless you. Just look in the mirror when you find out who voted the wrong way. Thank you. I Thank yield you. back. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Thompson from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. And I especially want to thank Mr. Neal, the ranking member, uh, for, uh, and he, he mentioned it, the work that we did in this committee in the retirement uh, security space. We did some great work in your work on, uh, on Butch Lewis. And I might add that uh, that was a pretty bipartisan effort with you and Mr. Brady. Uh, and I, I, I just want to uh, tell you how much not only those of us on a dais, but the people we represent appreciate that. 
But Mr. Chairman, I've got to admit, I'm a little bit confused about the topic of today's hearing. Uh, this is the oldest committee in Congress. We have oversight over some of the most pressing issues faced by our constituents. And I'd, I'd just like to point out that woke retirement plans doesn't even crack the top 10 on the list of issues I hear about back home. I've heard repeatedly lately about Israel, Ukraine, the importance of clean energy, the, da the dangerous climate change that we face, uh, the dangers of gun violence, the potential government shutdown, and the dysfunction that kept us from doing our work on the floor for, all, for over three weeks. I've heard more about going about the uh, daylight savings time debate than I have about any woke retirement plans. And, um, and, I, I, and I, I think I know why, and I want to submit this for the record. You know, you just look at the economic um, uh, environment after we, uh, our work in the, in the last Congress, 14 million jobs created under the Biden administration, unemployment rate below 4% for 21 straight months, the longest stretch in more than 50 years, core inflation at its lowest level in two years, GDP expanded at 4.9% from July to September, and wages increased 1.2% in the third quarter. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, submit this to the record. Without objection, so ordered. So now, I, I think investors should be permitted to take into account climate and other factors. In fact, I think that is simple ep economics. Does anyone think insurers don't factor climate change into their calculations? Uh, we all know they do. I mean, my district insurance companies are running out of my district because of climate change and the impact that the climate change uh, ramifications have had on my district. The fires that just ravaged uh, Northern California uh, as an, an example. Investors in retirement plans should take into account these risks and should not be dissuaded from investing in clean energy technology. Uh, that's why uh, legislation such as the Inflation Reduction Act, which included billions of dollars in green tax incentives, is so important in addressing uh, this issue. And it's not bad investment. It's not bad business practices. Mr. Chairman, for the record, uh, I would like to uh, submit this study from Morgan Stanley, uh, their Institute for Sustainable Investing, uh, that explains just that. It's good investment, and people are seeing a good return on that uh, investment. And with, I'd like to submit this for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Thank you. Ordered. So, um, Mr. Reese, on this point, um, the myths that uh, we're considering uh, today that clean energy technology would har harm retirees, uh, is it true that current federal law imposes fiduciary duty on private sector retirement plan investors to make prudent investments on behalf of their clients? And if so, can you explain how that works and why this is a bogus issue today? Yes, sir, and thank you for the question. Uh, the Department of Labor has long regulated re retirement plan fiduciaries in the consideration of ESG factors, uh, and retirement plan fiduciaries understand that the consideration of ESG factors uh, must be considered through the lens of loyalty and prudence uh, in protecting the retirement savings of, of the, the working people that they've been entrusted to protect. Uh, and so that, that has been uh, part of the record for, um, for many decades and most recently confirmed in the Department of Labor's 2022 ESG rule, as uh, uh, Preston explained. Thank you. So testimony. combating climate uh, change will require both public and private investment. Is it safe to assume that anti-ESG laws could cause financial harm for future retirees? Uh, yes, my written testimony refers to many of these state bills that are estimated to cost billions of dollars to state retirement systems uh, by enforcing blacklists against certain asset managers that consider ESG factors. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize Mr. Schweikert of Arizona. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I don't want to be too much of a heretic here. Um, I'm a huge fan of something called information theory. Um, I'm sure everyone here is a big fan of George Gilder, the economist. He's 
both a friend and comes and visits me on a couple occasions, though he's getting, he's got to be 90 now. And the basic premise there is um, if you have, you can have minimal regulation as long as you have quality information. Lots and lots and lots of information. He has this whole model that says 2008 would have never happened if we had the information what was in the bonds. You would have had price discovery and, and you would not wake up one day and say, oh God, what's going on in the bonds? And they collapse. But this is, um, and for you know, our, our friend from you know, the union representative to some of the others, let's actually have a bit of an honest discussion here for a moment. Okay, so some of our activists want disclosures on you know, potential theoretical whatever you want to say in regards to environmental impairments. Um, and I wasn't able to finish the math before it became my time, but my math says in about 18 years, you'd have to double every single U.S. tax to stabilize um, spending, to, to just keep current services. All U.S. taxes have to double. Shouldn't that be disclosed? I mean, should, should because um, if you double taxes, the majority of businesses in the, in the Russell are actually upside down. They would have negative. So it, part of my discussion here is if this is about a disclosure regime, for individuals, um, pension plans, others to make investment decisions, okay, well, what's the breadth of the disclosures? Should it be um, political impairment? Should it be um, our debt? And the fact of the matter, that is going to require us sometime in the next decade to, if you want to stabilize, to double U.S. taxes. Just, it's, it's demographics and spending. Why isn't that not advocated by my brothers and sisters also on the left, that it's the full breadth uh, of, of disclosures. Um, you know, my friend over there, he and I have both a fixation on retirement security. We see sometimes the math differently, but I'm terrified when I look at some of these articles of the number of baby boomers because of housing prices who are expected to be on the street and those things. But, but that's sort of a derivative of what this conversation really should be. Does the way we are approaching saying, okay, disclose these things, but don't disclose these things. We've turned it political. And when we make it political, we are going to screw up markets. Um, look, you're all freaky smart. Tell me what's wrong with my theory that if you're gonna have a regime that says these have to be disclosed as potential impairments to the value of these securities, why shouldn't it be the full breadth? Um, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Isaac, I'll, I'll let you go first because you said something a little while ago that was somewhat close to this. Why shouldn't it be the full breadth of impairments, whether it be my version of taxes, whether it be fertility rates, whether it should be you know, um, environmental issues? As someone who works at a research institution, more information is helpful, and this would certainly be helpful. And We have no issue with individual investors making investment decisions if they don't want to invest in companies that manufacture ammunition or guns, or if they don't want to invest in companies that manufacture hydrocarbons necessary for life on Earth. They don't have to, and they shouldn't have to, but the, what we're seeing is this politicization of capital and it's being weaponized okay. against the very interests. So now you're beating me to the second half. So in that case, the discussion here is, I put my money into my TSP, you know, our thrift savings account for federal employees, or if you're in CalPERS or something else. What influence, what's, now we keep being told DOL says you gotta maximize rates of return. But we also know there is certain governance issues of, well, we want to invest in this, but this company makes ammunition, and we have problems with that. Um, what influence should those, when you're investing that retiree's money, and then you also run into a demographic issue, would a young you know, contributor to the pension have a very different view than someone that's getting very close to retirement if you actually said, hey, I have, you know, how many, thousands of government employees and let them vote on it. So how do you build that structure? Um, and I know actually union organizations go through these battles all the time, but at some point, the real focus of this discussion almost should be more, does DOL really force their baseline rules of maximizing safe rates of return for future retirement? And for those of us who are interested, disclose everything. I'm terrified of the fact that U.S. debt, I believe, is going to make it so much of corporate America no longer is profitable. 
I actually see that as a much more realistic number than some of my in, in global warming and climate change numbers. Disclose both of them. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I ne uh, next uh, recognize Mr. Larson of Connecticut. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I thank you for your opening uh, remarks. Well, not you, Mr. Smith. You weren't in the chair at the time, but uh, uh, and uh, you're concerned about the elderly and seniors. I, I think it's profound. And so here we are talking about a subject matter today. As several have pointed out, we're on the verge of a governmental shutdown. We have major issues in front of us. And when it comes to protecting seniors, we're concerned about an issue that impacts 4% of people who have 401ks. So uh, suffice it to say, uh, as my colleagues know, we need to talk directly about Social Security. That is the responsibility of this committee. We are the committee of cognizance with regard to Social Security. Congress has not enhanced Social Security in more than 52 years. My colleague, who's always very good with numbers, let me remind him, 70 million Americans will be needing Social Security. 70 million fellow Americans, and yet Congress has stood still and not enhanced Social Security since Richard Nixon was President of the United States. Not only do we sit here and say we're trying to help out seniors today, what a joke! 10,000 baby boomers a day become eligible for Social Security, and the Committee of Cognizance should be holding hearings on Social Security and talking about what you plan to do for it. We have our plan. We want to extend the solvency. We want to extend benefits. We want to make sure that the more than 5 million fellow Americans who get below poverty level checks now get uplifted. We want to make sure that we provide 23 million Americans a tax cut. We want to make sure that every single one of your districts who receive Social Security monies get enhanced so that we can help people on fixed incomes in this time of inflation to be able to utilize their money locally where it will have the greatest impact. These are your brothers and sisters. These are family members. It is an embarrassment and a disgrace that in the United States Congress, we cannot address the nation's number one anti-poverty program for the elderly, the number one anti-poverty program for children, and we're in a committee today talking about an impact of 4% on people with 401ks. I hope the American public is listening. There are our solutions that are out there. Let me ask the audience, how many of you out there make more than $400,000 a year? Raise your hand. Funny thing about that, President Biden has said very simply, we can fix this issue by simply lifting the cap on people making over $400,000 a year. Wow, what a stress that would put on everybody across this country. And yet what it would do is put America back on track in terms of what we need to be doing on behalf of our fellow citizens. The number one anti-poverty program for the elderly, the number one anti-poverty program for children. And my colleagues on the other side sit in silence. Look in the mirror, ask yourself if you feel good about what you're doing to your fellow Americans who haven't received an enhancement in more than 52 years. Don't try to do some double secret probation committee behind closed doors 
where no one will get to discuss, especially the Committee of Cognizance, so that you can make a maneuver to cut people's benefits. Let's have a public discussion the way it should be, out front. Our proposals versus your proposals. That's the way a democracy is supposed to work. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I, I, I do want to emphasize that even if we subjected all Social Security, uh, all earnings to Social Security payroll taxes, let's see, the numbers say that Social Security would still have about a $10 trillion shortfall over the next 75 years. I think these are important data points uh, to, to keep in mind as we, I hope, have a bipartisan discussion to solve. What about a bipartisan plan? That uh, uh, we, we had a bipartisan action uh, to help clergy uh, just uh, recently, and, and I think we can focus on that moving forward. I now recognize Mr. LaHood from, from Illinois. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and I want to thank our witnesses today for your valuable testimony and the conversation. And I just want to first uh, acknowledge, you know, since the Biden administration took office in January of 21, we, we've seen time and time again this administration prioritize social issues above all else. And, and the result of that has really been the disruption and the dismantling of many of the historic economic strides that were made in the previous administration. We had the best economy in my lifetime pre-COVID, partly due to TCJA and a number of the policies put in place. That's changed uh, since the Biden administration came in. And so today's discussion, I think, is an important one as we better understand how the fixation on ESG activism by the executive branch and many U.S. companies is really leaving s seniors and people that save money in the middle class and their retirement at risk. And I'd like to first concentrate on the corporate side of this issue and how intense the intense focus on ESG by companies can be misguided and unnecessary uh, to the detriment of shareholders. Um, I, I just read an article um, that I'm going to submit for the record here. It's an article written by Harvard Business Review in 2022 by Professor Sanjay Bhagat, um, who has been an active leader on this issue and highlighted the potential redundancy in businesses putting a particular focus on ESG. And what he says in this article is, quote, in competitive labor markets and product markets, corporate managers trying to maximize long-term shareholder value should, of their own accord, pay attention to employee, customer, community, and environmental interests on, the base, on this basis. Setting ESG targets may actually distort decision-making, unquote. What's more, th this article goes on to cite uh, an academic paper that found evidence that numerous companies have used an in increased focus on ESG as a justification for poor business performance. So, Mr. Chairman, I would ask uh, unanimous consent to cons uh, submit the professor's article for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Isaac, uh, do you agree with the claim that ESG targets by companies distort corporate decision making? And if so, do you see companies reconciling that distortion with what should be the primary objective, maximizing shareholder value? Unequivocally, yes and yes. And that's why there's this huge push and why it's being driven down as you look at over three quarters of the executives of S&P 500 have their compensation tied to ESG goals. Over three quarters of S&P 500 company executives, their compensation is tied to ESG. That's why we're seeing the prevalence. This is why this affects so many, more than 4% of the people that have 401ks. It affects the entire economic prosperity of this country. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Rutledge, um, on the asset manager side, I appreciated your testimony. I'm sure this issue can be particularly challenging for, for managers. Um, who do work globally, given the strong focus on ESG investing within the European Union. Can you comment on this and maybe share what we could be looking at in the U.S. Uh, were, were to trend more towards the current EU regulatory framework in the future? Well, I sympathize um, with companies that are working Mike. globally. Mike. Is this not working? Just get it closer. Is. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. I sympathize with the companies that invest, have to make investment decisions globally. <clears throat> the thing that gets missed in Europe and is that 
for that several trillion dollar slice of institutional assets that are in ERISA-governed plans, be they defined benefit or defined contribution, they're subject to the ERISA exclusive purpose rule and the exclusive benefit rule. Exclusive is a pretty strong word. It's been there for 50 years, and it's actually been in the code for 100 years. It's a very strong word, exclusive, meaning exclusive for invest the money for the, the participants in the plan. It's not the, in, the trustee's money, it's the worker's money. In Europe, they don't have, and, uh, and frankly, even maybe at the state level in this country, because ERISA doesn't cover state governed plans. If you're outside of a, of a system that has that exclusive purpose rule or that exclusive benefit rule, then governments can have different perspectives. They can perhaps have rules that require investing in certain ways that, that don't maximize returns for, for some other purpose. So I very much sympathize. I would say, we've, in a way, we've already done what we can for our, our, our American uh, pension, pension plan participants and in, in ERISA government plans by having that exclusive purpose rule and exclusive benefit rule. Um, I would be, um, I would just uh, I say our regulators should probably approach the, the companies that are caught in those crosshairs uh, with regulators from, say, Europe um, um, with, with some, um, some sympathy, not bring the hammer down too hard on them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Pasquale from New Jersey. Morning, Mr. Chairman. Nice day in the neighborhood again. I believe that this hearing is based on an entirely false premise. Do you want me to believe that the retiree, male or female, sitting in wherever he lives, in the United States of America is not concerned as much about whether he's going to wake up to have his house under him tomorrow morning when he sees the glaciers melting. That has nothing to do with retirement. That's what we're talking about. We're not saying that the investment should not be reasonable, thought out. I'm saying today, this is what I personally believe, that the factors that we're talking about as if they're something from Mars happening here right now, been happening, whether it's the environment, whether it's social factors, and whether it's whatever. Fiduciaries are obligated to act in the best financial interest of beneficiaries. We all know that. This is not grade school here. There's no evidence that I've read, you can direct me, properly speaking, of environmental, social governance factors harming investors. Now, you may not make as much if you take those factors into consideration, but that doesn't say they're irrelevant or are not as important. None of you said they're irrelevant. I'm not saying that. Sustainable investments often provide the greatest returns over the long term. This is a partisan attempt to stoke fear over a total non-issue. It is a distraction from the majority's other failures. Here's the truth. This is what I believe. This is one of the most dysfunctional and unproductive Congress in history, according to many. Democrats are protected in retirement security. You've heard about the Butch Lewis Act. Read it. See what it says. I think it's very important to the future of what we're talking about today. I may be wrong. Show me. Democrats have protected retirement security for many, many workers. Not a single member on the other side of the aisle voted for this essential relief last Congress. It gets worse. House Republicans brought our nation to the brink of devastating the fall with their debt ceiling debacle. You made a deal and you couldn't keep it. You did it, not us. And now we face the same thing next week. 
And we're here talking about the irrelevance in investments of environment and social needs of this nation. We nearly saw retirement accounts vanish. Millions of Americans cut off from Social Security and Medicare. And the study committee of the other side, which represents three quarters of Republicans, proposed slashing Social Security benefits by $718 billion. These are the biggest threats, biggest threats to America's retirement security. Democrats are building a stronger pro-worker economy. Where are they? Every job lost during the pandemic has been recovered. So the job growth is at a 40-year high. Unemployment is at a 54-year low. The economy is booming. This president never gets any credit. He never was even congratulated when he became the president. They don't even recognize him as the president. Who the hell do they think they are? We need genuine action to protect retirement. Mr. Reese, let me ask you this question. How could future legislation build upon the successes of Butch Lewis to further strengthen retirement security? Thank you for the question. We would like to see employers be required to contribute to their employees' defined contribution plans when the employer does not provide a defined benefit plan. How does the tax code provide the bulk of retirement incentives to the highest earners? Uh, the deduction you receive for contributing to a 401k plan uh, is more valuable the more money you make. So while we bleed, in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, while we bleed about the growing debt of this nation, we don't bleed about the growing tax cuts to the richest people in this country. The gentleman's country. time has expired. Baloney! The gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize Mr. Arrington from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, witnesses. Um, Mr. Pascrell is a friend, so, so be gentle with him, Mr. Isaac. But answer his question about seeing no evidence that ESG is affecting the returns on investment from these hardworking Americans that are counting on the maximum value of their investment for their retirement security. Just hit a couple of them. I'm, I, let me, you know what, rather than ask you, let me, let me be a little more efficient. You said that a negative 0.2% was the ROI on ESG on average, and that the average return on investment with the S&P 500 was 19% in comparison, and with NASDAQ it was 25%. That's a pretty stark contrast in economic value accruing to the, to the investor, to the employee, for their retirement. Look, I think it's fair to debate ESG on its merits. I really do. Let's talk about environmental and social policies, and let's establish those. And there, I think there are some uh, a federal nexus to, to, to those um, issues. But they should be debated in the legislative context, not through rulemaking. That's, I think, the bigger issue here. I think the ESG is wrongheaded. I think as a policy and the substance and merits of the policy, not this labor rule, and, and as it applies to fund managers, but just on its own merits. I think it's divisive, further dividing the country. I think it's destructive to our economic prosperity ends, to our national security, to our way of life, to our leadership in the world. But hell, I'll make those arguments when we debate them on the floor of the United States House. Not by ceding Article I powers, and you know them better than I do, and have articulated a wonderful treatise on Article I. This is giving away Article I instead of debating this. In my opinion, that's the bigger issue. Circumvention of the constitutional democratic republic as we know it, and there's too much of it. And people are weary of the regulatory overreach. And it does feel like tyranny every time you turn around. And it's not just the economic cost. It's popular sovereignty, which is the fundamental, foundational cornerstone of this great republic. The will of the people speaks through us, not through some bureaucrat at the DOJ. And so if we are to honor 
what our founding fathers espoused as a central doctrine. There is no just government except those that govern with the consent of the people. That's what's being undermined here. Let's debate ESG. I think we ought to have more guns in the hands of law-abiding citizens to protect our communities against the crime spree and the criminals that are running amok and trampling the freedom and the lives of our families. I think we ought to have more pro-life policies, values, and culture. I think we ought to have a pump jack in every backyard in order to maintain energy independence and dominance. But let's debate that not by putting those policies that I favor in some regulatory rigmarole coming out of some bureaucracy on account, uh, on account of the fact that they can't get it through Congress. I doubt I could get my wishes through Congress. I mean, we repealed this thing through a CRA, and it was bipartisan. That was very thin on the Democrat side, I'll admit. I don't want people to think it was 50-50. But by God, we, we repealed it in the House and the Senate. And the president said, I don't give a rip. I'm going to advance this environmental agenda, whether you like it or not, America. That's why, that's why that's, that was the sentiment. He didn't say it, but that was the sentiment. And look, in my last 30 seconds, <laughs> I love John Larson. And I wish we all had the passion he has to fix the solvency issue of, of, of Social Security and Medicare. But let's be clear for the people here. If you didn't make $400,000, you didn't get the tax, I mean, you didn't get the subsidy from Obamacare that was $65 billion that could have gone to the so solvency of Social Security. And, and one more thing. They cut Medicare, they got savings out of Medicare through the price fixing on Part D. That didn't go back into the solvency of Medicare. It went to subsidizing green energy corporations with tax breaks. So as we say, spare me the lecture. I hope he had the same enthusiasm to chastise the Democrat Party and his colleagues for when you had total control of the House and the Senate and you took money out of those things for environmental, climate-related, and not for the benefit of the seniors. I know I've gone over my time, but I mean, this is rich. I mean, we're, this is rich in hypocrisy. And I, 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 I love you guys, but I can't hear that and not respond. God bless America. Go West Texas, and I yield back the balance of, of my time. Mr. Davis is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, God bless America. Indeed. Because I think right now America is teetering and tottering and is seriously divided and split. Mr. Reese, I'm so proud of the work that Democrats have done in the last few years to strengthen retirement for workers and families. In addition to setting auto enrollment into 401ks and improving the savers credit, my bill that was enacted to help younger workers start saving for retirement and by letting companies use their retirement matches for employee student loan payments, those have been and are indeed helpful. Further, the enactment of the multi-employer pension provision via the Butch Lewis Act already helped stabilize retirement for over 388,000 Illinoisans whose retirement was at risk of collapse due to no fault of their own. At the end of the day, Social Security is the main retirement plan for the majority of people who live in my district, who live in the district where I live and work. Yet, this Republican House is committed to cutting Social Security, undermining retirement security. 
how can you not realize that Social Security, the enactment of the Social Security laws and benefits, actually is the only door that millions of people in this country have to survive retirement. And if we do anything to it and with it that cuts it, this damages all of these individuals who have no other recourse. And so, Mr. Reese, can you speak about the importance that the multi-employer pension changes were to states like Illinois and how critical Social Security is for low-income black and brown workers, as well as all of the others who would be entering the workspace? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. I'll start with addressing uh, the need to strengthen and protect Social Security. According to a new study that the National Institute of Retirement Security has recently issued, 40% of seniors rely on Social Security as their only source of income. The average Social Security benefit is a meager $22,000 a year. We need to strengthen Social Security by lifting the cap on taxable earnings so that CEOs pay the same effective tax rate that working people pay on their income to support retirement security. And regarding the state of Illinois, uh, the PBGC has already accepted and approved uh, applications uh, for uh, special financial assistance for multi-employer plans of over 388,000 uh, citizens of Illinois with annual pension benefits uh, totaling in the in the billions, so, in the millions. So uh, I, I appreciate the question, and um, we really feel that this committee needs to be focused on the retirement income security crisis, not distractions like ESG wokeness. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. My voice may not be as strong as that of John Larson, but my passion is just as great in terms of Social Security and what it means for the American people. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Ferguson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, when we started this, my good friend, ranking member, said something that I fully agree with, and that is Americans don't want to be told by the government what to do. Well, Americans also were business owners, and Americans are investors. And let's start with a very basic premise that the reason that American business exists is to return a profit to its shareholders. That's the sole purpose of, of running a business. <clears throat> and I think, it is, I think it is wrong to co-opt the business community to, to basically carry out a social agenda by our colleagues from the other side of the aisle. Businesses are, are there to make money to return value to the shareholder or to the investor, period. That's why it exists. That's why my dental practice existed. It was there so that it could provide a return to my, to my family and to my, and to my employees in the terms of a paycheck. So we should be doing everything that we can, everything that we can to make American business the most competitive in the world. We should be drawing investment from around the globe because that is where we get the greatest return. And to you know, and to think that folks like Mr. Reese are dictating to us what, where, where, you know, where we should be investing with ESG, this is the same group that failed to, do the, to make the reforms and the needed changes in the pension plans before they went belly up. So, Mr. Reese, I apologize if I don't, take, if I don't want to take your, your advice too seriously, but, you know, we, we got pension plans that were going broke for years because basically the unions and the union leadership would not do the right thing to, to shore those up. That's a whole other conversation. But when we go down this road of, of causing companies to do things so that they can, that, that go against their core mission so that they can simply attract investment dollars, that is counterproductive. It's not an efficient use of capital. And in return, American businesses slow down and they don't hire as many workers. 
Now, if we want to have a serious conversation about Social Security, let's keep in mind that we need more people working and paying into the system, not fewer. So every time that we drive a business to lower productivity and to make them hire, hire fewer people, we are hurting the very group that we're trying to help, which is to make sure that our seniors are protected. So when, when America is less competitive and we're not hiring as many workers and we're, not, and we're not building and inventing here in America and selling around the world, then we're, then we're backing up and we're hurting the Social Security system. I think it's important to put out there. Also, and Mr. Isaac, Mr. Oaks, I'll let y'all answer this question. Don't you think it would be wise to allow or maybe, maybe have rulings that allow shareholders and participants in funds to sue the fiduciary for failure to give the best return on the investment? Don't you think that would be a wise thing? Mr. Oaks, I'll start with you. And just if you could kick that around, um, I, I would appreciate that. And Mr. Isaac, you follow up on that. Yeah, I think uh, we are already seeing lawsuits uh, along those lines. So in New York, one of the uh, pension systems is being sued for uh, pursuing ESG as a um, strategy in their fund um, because it is clearly counter to the fiduciary duty. And, and that sort of of uh, legal action, I think, is required to uphold the fiduciary standard that we all hold dear to us, because that leads to the, the outcomes that we want, the, the financial outcomes that all of us need for our, our retirement. Very good. Mr. Isaac? And I believe several states are suing. Your attorneys generals are acting. And I believe it's S&P Global that was issuing credit ratings based on ESG scores. They were considering ESG metrics, and now because of this pressure, they've dropped that, which is interesting to me because you look at Sri Lanka at one time had the highest ESG rating of any country on the planet, and their first ever elected net zero candidate on the face of the earth implemented net zero policies and crushed their economy within one year, said no use of nitrogen-based fertilizers, <clears throat> food production down 40%, cost up 80%. Today, nine in 10 people are hungry in Sri Lanka because of one person. I, t I tell you, it's, it's a great example. Look, Americans want a paycheck, where they can take care of their families. They want to come home to a decent, safe place to live. They want their children educated, and they want this place to leave them the heck alone. That's a common thread that runs through every American. And let me tell you something. When you enforce or you go down the road of, of imposing ES, ESG requirements and all, all of this stuff, it, does, it violates every single one of those pillars. It's the government telling you where you can invest, where you can't invest. The wokeness that occurs in the school system is destroying the education system. It is leading to policies that make our communities less safe. And you know what? Look at inflation. Look at where we are with interest rates. <clears throat> it's not the American economy and Bidenomics is not working for the American people. That a yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Fer Ferguson. Congratulations on your Bulldogs victory over the weekend as well. I, I was not going to say it, but I will. How about them dogs? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Winsor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to play off of what uh, my good friend Dr. Ferguson was just talking about and, and the things I want to say. As a member of Congress, I always ask myself when considering <laughs> policy, uh, will it make Americans more free and will the next generation say thank you? And I think we should take those types of things into consideration when we go ahead with policy. But allowing unelected fi financial bureaucrats with their own agenda to invest America's retirement savings in risky and unproven ventures to support an agenda of alarmism and social policy certainly doesn't make us more free. A free market is not free when major financial players are colluding behind the scenes to limit investment options and favor funding companies and projects that fit a certain agenda, especially financially failing agendas. The next generation certainly won't thank us when their retirement savings are a fraction of what they need because activist investment managers went out of their way to promote an agenda rather than serving their customers uh, faithfully. Frankly, I think Americans would be shocked to see where their hard-earned dollars are being diverted each and every day now. You know, it, it, so not only do these policies harm investors, they distort U.S. capital markets and more broadly hurt our economy by diverting funds away from the most, most worthy investment options and, pri and instead prioritize pet projects that otherwise would not receive funding. 
I think the most egregious example of this is in the energy sector. As we know, financial heavyweights like BlackRock have committed to ending fossil fuels and are staging an investment boycott against American companies who produce energy. Couldn't come at a worse time. A time when we need to increase energy production to lower prices for American consumers and provide much needed energy supplies to our allies in Europe who need to wean off of Russia natural gas in order to fully enforce sanctions against Putin and his regime. None of this makes any sense on behalf of national security for the United States and our allies. Worse yet is our investment managers to put their fingers on the scale for green energy projects. These very same investment dollars are ultimately flowing to our adversaries in the Chinese Communist Party. This is completely backwards of the America that I know, or thought I knew, and as we have discussed before in this committee, China dominates the supply chain for products like solar panels, electric vehicle batteries, and that's not even to mention pharmaceuticals, which is a grave risk to the United States. We've already spent billions in taxpayer dollars subsidizing the purchase of Chinese energy products. The last thing we need to do is compound that failure by steering Americans' retirement savings towards <clears throat> these same Chinese-related industries. You know, I always say, uh, by the way, until Air Force One can fly on a solar panel and we can make those solar panels, then we'll talk about fossil fuels. But until that day comes, it should be off the table and let the market and, and technology dictate, not this. So I fear the next generation will not look kindly on the future that we build or is being built around us right now by aiding and abetting our geopolitical adversaries with our own retirement savings. Think about that. We're taking people's retirement savings and helping China and weakening ourselves. It makes no sense. Mr. Isaac, can you discuss the uh, dangers of an ESG-fueled investment boycott of fossil fuels and how steering Americans' retirement funds toward green energy benefits our geopolitical adversaries like China? Yeah, I, I call it the China ESG agenda, and it's working as designed, as planned. You look at the North American oil and gas private capital being invested. In 2015, there were 58 funds that raised nearly $50 billion to produce energy in this country, where we produce it more responsibly than anywhere else on the world. And that energy holds the key to ending poverty as we know it. It results in economic prosperity. And just in 2022, we've seen a 76% reduction in the number of funds raised and a 92% reduction in dollars raised in North American capital to produce American energy. And that's why we're not producing nearly as much as we could. We're shifting production, not demand, but we're shifting production. And we're seeing dollars flow into Iran from China to the tune of 50 to $80 billion because of the ESG agenda. And guess who's going to be and buying the refined products that China is producing because they've expanded their refining capacity? The United States will be buying jet fuel, diesel, and home heating oil made from Iranian oil that is funding this war on terror. And what are Americans feeling? From 2021 to 2022, there was a 30% increase in Americans having their electricity disconnected, a 76% increase in Americans having their natural gas disconnected in this country. This is the China ESG agenda, and it is working as designed to the detriment of our country and to the detriment of our economic prosperity. Thank you. We need to lay the blame where it belongs. I yield back. Ms. Sanchez is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are just 10 days remaining before governmental funding expires, and yet Republicans seem utterly unconcerned that they are once again steering us towards a fiscal cliff. And so today we're talking about retirement security, which is an important topic. But my Republican colleagues who are so concerned about shareholders aren't talking about the economic hit that all Americans, seniors, veterans, children, working parents, and our servicemen and women will take when our government shuts down. Yet here we are 
not dealing with serious and even life-threatening issues, but we're talking about the woke boogeyman that Republicans love to invoke whenever they want to distract from their inability to govern. This committee has a strong history of advancing bipartisan retirement policy that benefits American workers. So I'm disappointed that today's hearing is this politically charged, and I want to refocus on retirement policy that actually helps working families. Take the Butch Lewis Act, which has saved hundreds and thousands of pensions, benefiting tens of thousands of workers in California alone. Or consider the provision that I led in the SECURE Act that reduced filing costs for small businesses looking to establish retirement plans for their workers. Or the Starter K Act that Mr. LaHood and I worked to include in SECURE 2.0. Our bipartisan provisions streamlined regulations and lowered costs for small businesses and startups, leading to more access to easy retirement savings. And despite bipartisan achievements in the retirement space, too few Americans have not saved enough for their retirement. Women, especially women of color, fall, fall far behind in saving when they can no longer, for when they can no longer work. On top of the overall earning gap, Latino, Asian, and black populations are more likely to work for employers that don't sponsor any savings plans for retirement. We have to acknowledge that workers of color are more likely to face access and eligibility hurdles that can prevent them from enrolling in retirement plans. So why aren't we talking about this? Why is the committee not talking about this? American workers deserve certainty and security as they prepare for a time when they can no longer work. I hope that our committee can refocus on ensuring that low and middle American families can rely on retirement savings or even can work for uh, an employer that provides some kind of retirement savings plans. Mr. Reese, in your professional opinion, which do you think would hurt working American families more? ESG, which we're talking about today in this hearing, or a government shutdown, which my Republican colleagues don't seem to want to talk about? A government shutdown. Uh, what would that do to the cost of borrowing, let's say, for the average American family? It would likely increase the cost of borrowing. And what would that do to our economy if the government were to shut down? It would put our economy in a tailspin, hurting investment returns. Would it, would it hurt our, our government's credit rating? Yes, it would. Okay, great. I wish we were talking about that, but we're not today. Um, Mr. Reese, I want to thank you for your testimony that highlights key legislation that actually has helped American workers build retirement savings. What do you consider key policies that this committee could pursue to address working people's mounting retirement insecurity? We need to strengthen Social Security. We need to uh, increase employer contributions to employees' retirement savings accounts when they don't have a defined benefit plan. And we need to allow investment uh, fiduciaries of retirement plans the freedom to invest, to consider ESG factors because they are relevant to, inv to investment return decision making. You know, one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle said that he asks himself, will, will future generations thank us? Do you think future generations will thank us if we don't do something about the fact that our Earth is dying because of global warming and the pollutants that we're putting into the air, which is causing severe weather storms? Do you think future generations would thank us for doing nothing about that? No, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Rutledge, can you expand on how Secure 2.0 has helped small businesses address barriers and offer retirement plans to their employees? Yes, thank you, um, Representative Sanchez. A couple of really good provisions in Secure 2.0 included some tax credits for small employers that have never had a plan setting them up. That would be one a new kind of 401k that's extremely simple called the starter K. The idea behind that is if an employer can set up a very simple plan, <clears throat> low maintenance, um, and after a few years they will hopefully set up a full-blown 401k. Um, also there's a, the refundable savers credit was made, I'm sorry, the savers credit, which had been in the law for a while, was made refundable, which will be particularly helpful for people um, that do not, that are at an income level where they don't have a federal income tax liability, they will nevertheless get that credit and it'll be deposited in their 401k or their IRA, wherever they're contributing. 
I'd say those would be three things that, this, that the Secure 2.0 Act did. Um, um, there probably are others that I'm missing, but those would be the three that come to mind um, most, most prominently. Thank you for your testimony, and I yield back. Oh, Mr. Estes is recognized. Well, thank you, Chairwoman. And uh, thank you for our, uh, that sounds good, doesn't it, Chairwoman? Um, as you're, as you're sitting there. Uh, thank you for our witnesses as well for uh, being here to discuss this phenomenon that uh, is quietly reshaping American life to the detriment of seniors and savers. I, I know I, I want to stay focused on ESG. I know a lot of there's been a lot of distractions around various other topics that we talked about, whether it was a, a, a bailout of uh, a pensions where the trustees had failed to uh, be held accountable for their fiduciary responsibility as a result. Taxes are increased for uh, single moms in my district. We talked about uh, see, critical race theory, climate change, uh, talked about potential shutdown, even though we're focusing on appropriations bills this week, a host of other things. But I want to talk about ESG. It's become really clear that ESG investing hurts seniors and other savers by privileging non-financial factors over positive financial outcomes. It's the opposite of fiduciary responsibility. Individuals have entrusted their money to corporations and firms to be stewarded towards a financial end, not some intangible goal in which they have no say. The record high inflation that we've seen since Joe Biden became president has underscored the importance of sticking to this critical mission. Finances are tight as inflation has grown more than 17% since President Biden took office. Kansans, including seniors on a fixed income, are having to stretch their dollars to spend nearly $1,000 more each month on the same goods and services and savers have seen inflation eat away at the funds they've set aside. Americans should be able to trust that institutions stewarding their hard-earned money are doing all they can to, to provide the best financial return, not leaving anything on the table in exchange for advancing activist goals. I've been concerned about the growing impact of ESG for a while, and last spring wrote an op-ed for The Hill on the threats imposed by ESG that I'd like to submit for the record. Chairwoman. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Treasurer Oaks, how can a citizen already suffering from Biden inflation take control of their investments and protect them from ESG activism? Thank you for the question. So one of the biggest challenges is that uh, the risk to their retirement is not just through ESG designated funds. What's happened is large, many, many large asset manage, managers have signed on to pledges that commit them to push ESG with all assets under management. And so they'll use, for example, a passive index fund and push ESG by using engagement with companies. And this is what people don't see. This is why a lot of people don't talk about it because they don't understand what's happening. You'll have large investment managers go into a large oil company, for example, and say, uh, you need to uh, reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. You need to create a plan to be net zero by 2050. And oil, by the way, you need to cut oil production by 20%. Who does that impact? It's not just the investors in that fund. It is not just the investors with that particular manager. It, in fact, it affects the entire marketplace. That's what we're talking about here. These, these are funds that are, you have to have a massive amount of money to drive an agenda through the capital markets. And that's why these asset managers have signed on to these pledges, these commitments to drive ESG and use all of their assets under management. That's why this is so dangerous. That's why it changes the economic system. That's why our economic freedoms are at risk. Well, thank you. And, you know, beyond just the impact on individuals, ESG activism is affecting everything from energy to agriculture to national security. Undoubtedly speaking to climate activists, President Biden declared on a campaign trail that he would end fossil fuels, unquote. In pursuit of this goal, he's undermined American energy independence, going so far as to drain the strategic petroleum reserve in a bid to bring price relief to consumers suffering from the results of his policies. Putin's invasion of, temp of Ukraine temporarily added a spike on top of the already soaring prices caused by President Biden. And now with the war in the Middle East, there's a risk of prices again climbing higher, all in pursuit of, an ans of answering the activists' calls to end fossil fuels. Mr. Isaacs, have you shared America, as, as you have shared, America continues to rely primarily on fossil fuels. If the United States continue to make it difficult for domestic energy producers, where will we get our energy from, energy from and who will benefit from that change? 
it will likely get our energy from people that don't care about us very much, and they'll control the price, like OPEC cutting production right now to the benefit of Russia, to the benefit of OPEC, to the benefit of Iran that's fighting this war and funding this war on terror right now, or, or, or f funding the terror, if you will. But for no environmental benefit whatsoever, if, if we do end fossil fuels by 2050, the temperature differential by 2100 using the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's model would be less than one-tenth of one degree difference. It's 0 .0892 degrees. That's no benefit. That's no benefit, but the costs are astronomical. We completely throw out our economic prosperity. And I think we need to thank our forefathers for what they've done, because if you look just at two generations ago, we started on this path to economic prosperity, and in, in result, world leaders in environmental protection, 80% reduction in pollution in five decades is incredible. We're number one when it comes to access to clean and safe drinking water. That's great that American Innovation has done that. You know, if the United States wants to pursue ESG goals, it certainly should not do so at the expense of ordinary American savings, much less our national security and global competitiveness. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, Mr. Hearn, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. In my 35 years of business with one of the largest brands in the world, we always incorporated non-financial objectives and aspects of environmental, social, and gov governance, uh, ESG, if you will, because if we disregarded these metrics, we would not have re remained competitive in the free market. The policy issue we are seeing here in the United States and across the globe is the weaponization and politicization of ESG to push activists, non-financial objectives, and ideology that ultimately does not align with the objectives we made this nation, uh, which made this nation an economic powerhouse. The United States was built on a free market where every dollar that is utilized for the greatest returns wins, and there are moments that stops, the economic dominance stops. In a free market, a business chooses to be an active steward of the environment, the first letter of ESG, because the free market demands it. Co companies implement environmental conservatism to reduce cost, enhance operational efficiency, and improve the business image in the public eye of their shareholders. Businesses make drastic efforts to be socially responsible in the communities in which they operate, the second letter in ESG, because the free market demands it. Without these communities, the business itself would cease to exist. Millions of businesses across the United States and abroad give back to their communities and invest in areas that were previously economic deserts. Without good governance, the third letter in ESG, we would see failure. Throughout the history of this great nation, we have seen businesses rise and fall due to substandard governance. Just most recently, the failure of FTX and Silicon Valley Bank because of def deficient governance. ESG investing receives a lot of attention due to its political nature, but Congress should be concerned about all investing that utilizes metrics separate from the majority of investors' best interests, which is to achieve the highest rate of return on their investment. How can we assign a fair value to ESG funds or businesses when not all shareholders are looking for a profitable return? The intrinsic value of a company is the present value of all expected future cash flows. What percentage of a business's future earnings is owned by the environment? What percentage of a business's future earnings are owned by socially responsible causes? It is impossible to assign values to these metrics, and while these metrics might be important to a business's success, Providing parity between these metrics and metrics aimed at to achieve the greatest rate of returns is dangerous. Millions of Americans rely on the capital markets to grow their wealth by investing their hard-earned savings. Congress needs to have a watchful eye on the markets, funds, and businesses that cater to activists and their non-financial goals instead of hard-working Americans saving for their retirement. Mr. Oaks, at the International Conference on Climate Change, you said, quote, when truth is relative, you can't define reality, end quote. Can you explain what you mean by that in relation to ESG? And by the way, I watched your 45-minute video okay. at 6 o'clock this morning. Very good job. Okay. All right, Kazari, can you repeat the question? When you talk about when truth is relative, you can't define reality. Can you talk about what in context you put that in as it relates to ESG? Yeah, so um, we have to understand uh, definitions. Uh, and, and definitions are one of the things that is being changed in, in uh, ESG. So when we talk about governance, for example, governance is under traditional shareholder capitalism. We're talking about board independence, stock performance incentives that, for uh, corporations. So companies have performed better historically by tying management pay to performance. Um, when, we, when we look at stakeholder capitalism, which is essentially ESG, governance has changed. We're now talking about demographic quotas 
for board members and for employees. Uh, and we're also talking about tying compensation to ESG metrics. So the definitions have changed. And, and what happens when we change the definitions is that we suddenly are not talking about the same things. We're hiding a, an agenda when the, we politicize the language. That's one of the biggest uh, things that's happening with ESG. Diversity, equity, inclusion under the social, same thing. Traditionally, we think of diversity, of uh, uh, ideological diversity and experiential d diversity. Now, we're talking about demographic only and ideological purity, equity. We think of equal opportunities, uh, or, or oppor equal opportunity in the United States, whereas today, uh, under the equity of DEI, it's equity of outcomes or equal outcomes. Inclusion, we think about colorblind society and, and meritocracy. Under, the, under uh, today's DEI, inclusion means discriminating against those who do not fit the chosen demographic. So we have to understand the definitions that we're talking about. This is one reason why uh, ESG is so dangerous is that oftentimes people hear the terminology, they think they understand it, um, but the definitions actually are different than what they think they mean. I'd like to thank the witnesses. Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields. Uh, Mr. Higgins from New York is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Um, America is 5% of the world's population. We're 25% uh, percent of the world's uh, economy. America is the world's richest, most productive, and innovative uh, of the, all the world economies. Uh, today, America is 58% of the wealth of the top seven countries in the world. We were 40% in 1990. The U.S. dollar is the go-to currency in the world. America owns 20% of the patents registered throughout the world, more than twice that of China and Germany. The five biggest corporate sources of research and development in the world are American. Investors who put $100 into the Standard & Poor's 500 a, uh, that tracks the performance of 500 largest companies in America would have more than $2,000 today. That's four times more than any other uh, country of the world would produce. Uh, the top 12 uh, of 15 universities in the world today are American universities. Um, the federal government has a history of bailing out insurance companies, banks that behave poorly, uh, car companies, uh, airline industries, but not doing nearly enough for our own people. And the purpose of an economy is to create a middle class because they pay our taxes, they fight our wars, they teach our children, and they protect our streets. The Butch Lewis Act, which was in large part due to the persistence of the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee at that time, Rich Neal, now the ranking member, saved 200 pension plans, $83 billion, 3 million retired workers. Before the Butch Lewis Act, uh, all of those plans would have become insolvent by 2026. Now they remain solvent until at least 2051. It seems to me that when you look at the American worker, which is the backbone of the middle class of America. The AFL-CIO is 60 national and international labor unions representing 12 and a half million people throughout the world. Mr. Reese, what do these programs mean to the American worker within the context of the importance of consumption within the American economy, which is 70% of all, or all of the American economy? Thank you for your question. Uh, I want to give an example of an ESG factor that the Federal Thrift Savings Plan uh, has considered to prohibit investment in China under President Trump. Uh, President Trump's Labor Secretary, Eugene Scalia, uh, prohibited the investment in China for national security and human rights reasons. That's a decision I agreed with for financial reasons because investing in China is risky because of opaque accounting in China and a lack of accounting oversight. 
Uh, and the Republican bills that have been introduced would prohibit retirement plans from considering those very same ESG factors. Uh, and so my point is that we should give financial advisors, we should give retirement plan fiduciaries the freedom to consider ESG factors when they deem them material to investment returns in the exact same way that the Trump administration did for the thrift savings plan that members of Congress participate in. I'll yield back. The gentleman yields. Uh, Ms. Mrs. Ms. Miller from West Virginia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman and Ranking Member Neal. And thank you all for spending time with us today. I appreciate it. I'm from the beautiful state of West Virginia, which for those of you who might not know, it is a leading energy producing state. Since 2008, the radical left wing war on coal, and quite frankly, for all forms of traditional baseload energy, has devastated the communities in my home state of West Virginia. Despite Washington liberals' best efforts, coal exports still amounted to $3.8 billion of economic activity in my home state. ESG mandates are just another opportunity for unelected bureaucrats to force freedom-loving Americas to accept one more step towards global socialism. We will never, never surrender to those who want to see our energy producing states destroyed and we will fight these mandates tooth and nail. The fact that the Biden administration is encouraging retirement plan managers to steer investment funds away from profitable time-tested energy companies and towards their pseudo-woke environmentalist corporations is not only fiscally irresponsible, it is a real slap in the face to hard-working folks like my constituents who are counting on these managers to do their job and ensure their retirement accounts are secure. Mr. Oates, thankfully in West Virginia, we know better than to let woke leave us broke. We've experienced it. In March, our state established a law which prevents the State Investment Management Board or fund managers from considering environmental, social, and corporal governance factors when managing retirees' finances. Mr. Oaks, can you come, you come from a state which has also taken a stand against the administration's misguided ESG policies. Can you tell us how retirees in your state are better off now that their financial managers are focused solely on financial returns? Yes, thank you. So, um, as I mentioned before, I think one of the key issues is that, that asset managers have committed all of their assets under management to drive this agenda. So it's not just ESG funds that are pushing ESG um, policies. And so that's, that's really the challenge here. Um, and, and several research um, studies have shown that ESG-related proxy measures often have a detrimental effect on financial returns. So the proxy vote is one of the uh, very important roles that an owner of a stock has. They can uh, exercise their right to uh, vote their shares on issues that come before a corporation. And, and unfortunately, this process is, is being hijacked. So there was a study published in the Journal of Financial Economics that investigated the influence of activist public pension funds on the market values of a subset of Fortune 500 companies. And the findings revealed a negative correlation between increased activism by public pension funds and stock returns. Additionally, companies receiving proposals from activist public pension funds advocating for social agendas were valued at 14% less 
compared to similar companies that did not pursue such agendas. So the Utah legislature took several uh, actions this past legislative session to protect Utahns. Um, very importantly, we passed a fiduciary standards law that included um, uh, voting proxies for the best interest in the best interest of the beneficiaries. That was one area that we had to look very closely at because it's not always obvious what the proxy advisory firms are doing, and it, it, they don't have uh, just an off-the-shelf fiduciary uh, standard kind of uh, uh, proxy um, system. So we worked on, on a fiduciary bill. Um, I sit on the boards of the Utah Retirement Systems and the School and Institutional Trust Fund, our sovereign wealth fund, um, and, and we are, we've worked to ensure that our proxy voting is in the best interest of our beneficiaries, that we're upholding the fiduciary standards, uh, and, and that we do not want uh, ESG or uh, investment managers pushing ESG agendas uh, on behalf of our retirees and, and the school children of Utah. Thank you so much. Mr. Bollet, I loved hearing about your background in your family farm. Some of us, some of the people here may not know, but Chairman Smith and I are both bison farmers. So hearing your implications of the ESG issues on family-run businesses and operations is important to me personally. I think you made a great point in your testimony that community bankers should have the freedom to make investment decisions that make sense to their customers rather than follow top-down mandates from bureaucrats in Washington that have no idea what is best fit for the individual communities. Can you talk a bit more about how ESG policies have the potential to harm small community banks and businesses? Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Congresswoman, and I'll be quick. Uh, Main Street's always taking care of Main Street, and it's best if you let us take care of Main Street and not have top-down driven policies. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, the gentlewoman yields. Uh, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Murphy, Dr. Murphy, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I want to thank all the uh, uh, folks for coming here today to discuss. It's just kind of interesting. I think our Democratic colleagues know that ESG is indefensible. That's why they're trying to talk about everything else, you know, the sun and the moon here. Um, just put plainly simple, this is a political motivation to try to move what should be an objective market. Very, very plain and simple. Um, through all the different tax uh, revelations and tax breaks given to Chinese companies for, for American companies, what we're doing is we're pouring American money into our greatest enemy, point blank, enemy into China, where China is now developing weapons against us, their navy's far advanced, et cetera, et cetera, and they're buying up the world. They own pretty much own New Zealand, they're owning Australia, they're bullying Australia literally today, and we're feeding China with this nebulous, absolutely out of touch reality. As you pointed out, Mr. Isaac, it's gonna be, what, 0.01% of a temperature raise? This is the problem when you make emotional decisions on math. Math is a very objective thing. Gosh, we all don't want what's happening with the earth. I believe that the climate is changing. I absolutely believe it. But I don't believe we can do a damn thing through all these maneuvers to change any of this stuff. What we're going to do is bankrupt America and allow the Chinese Communist Party to basically take over the world. And we're going to be sitting there thinking that the rainbows and unicorns are going to come out because we've you know, saved a few, or we've pushed a few pennies at the same time, worsening returns uh, for our investors. Uh, and Mr. Reese, you made a comment. You, you said, I don't want to put words again in your mouth, that you believe you, we should give financial advisors the freedom to use ESG, correct? Were, were those your words? That is correct. Okay. Mr. Isaac, then can I ask you, are, are financial advisors not their compensation based upon using ESG? Isn't that what you said earlier? Yeah, over 75% of executives in S&P 500 companies have their compensation tied to implementing ESG. Okay, so how's that freedom? <laughs> that's, that's not working out too well. Well, it's not. It's an absolute, we, you say you want freedom to use it, but no, they're tying their compensation to that. So that's, a, that's hello, that's not anything at all. And so, you know, I've heard from several advanced, uh, adv financial advisors back in my, uh, in my district that, that quote, you wouldn't believe what the hell pressure that these companies are putting us on. 
So guys, you know, I, I want to protect our environment. Gosh, I love, I live in the most beautiful district in the country in Eastern North Carolina, but these are absolutely ridiculous policies to think we're actually going to change what's going on, but we're going to bankrupt our country and at the same time empower our greatest enemies in Iran, in China, and Russia today by doing this. It's an absolute absurd pathological plan. So um, I, I'll just get back, I, you know, I was proud to introduce HR 9198 last year, the Safeguarding Investment Re for Options for Retirement Act, because it is a, a financial and fiduciary responsibility for financial advisors to return the highest amount to their investors, period, point blank. Does anybody on the panel disagree with that? No, those are mere numbers. You know, a rainbow does not buy dinner for somebody um, who's poor. I'm sorry, it, it just doesn't. So let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Isaac, in general, do Chinese businesses tend to focus on obtaining high ESG scores? <laughs> it's the last of their concern along with human rights and environmental protection. Yes, but then we fund all the money over to them. Do you think they're gonna be truthful on any of these things? I truly believe they're sitting back in Tiananmen Square, they're sitting back in, uh, in Beijing and laughing at us because we're chasing butterflies and rainbows to make us feel better emotionally. And we're really absolutely screwing the American public. And we're screwing the 250 years of democracy and turning us down. I mean, it, the math just doesn't seem to work. You know, I, I, Mr. Larson, I agree, he's not here anymore, but I would agree with your chair that we need to get working on Social Security. Absolutely. It was a plan put in place by Democrats many, many years ago without a future uh, plan that's going to hurt people today. Um, I, I guess there's just so much target-rich environment, I probably shouldn't go on. But uh, guys, you know, I, again, it is absolutely absurd that we motivate the markets to move because of a political agenda. I think even our Democratic colleagues understand that. We all want a beautiful environment. We all want to do with these things. But the markets are not based upon emotion. They're based upon math. With that, Madam Chairman, I'll yield back. The gentleman yields. Uh, Ms. Sewell from Alabama is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to echo some of the sentiments made earlier by many of the de Democratic co my, my Democratic colleagues highlighting the successful legislation that has emerged from this committee in both the 116th and the 117th Congress regarding retirement uh, security as well as retirement savings. These bipartisan achievements in our retirement system have for the first time in a generation since their enactment begun to elevate millions of Americans to financial security in their later years. The Butch Lewis the Butch Lewis Act is one very key example of how the work of the Ways and Means Committee have ushered in a new era in how American families save for their retirement. Not very long ago, just over 10,000 workers in Alabama, including Teamsters, steel workers, and mine workers in my district, were facing the serious threat of losing the hard-earned benefits that they fought for throughout their careers. Many of these workers, including those who spent decades working in coal mines, risking their life to provide for themselves and their families. Many have sacrificed wage increases throughout their careers to pay into their uh, pension as well as their retirement savings. Had we not enacted the passage of the Butch Lewis Act, an estimated 1.5 million American workers, retirees, and their families would have suffered as a result. Legislation like the Butch Lewis Act, SECURE Act, and SECURE Act 2.0 gave Congress the opportunity to protect American workers' retirement savings and guarantee pension benefits into the future, preserving the financial security for millions of Americans. There is still so much more work to be done. Mr. Reese, you spoke about how retirement savings for many Americans are out of reach for workers. What barriers exist to workers saving for retirement, like low wages and lack of eligibility? Can you talk about the barriers to retirement savings? Yes, ma'am. First and foremost, low wages make it impossible for working people to save for retirement when they're struggling to pay today's bills. Secondly, half of all working Americans do not participate 
in an employer-sponsored retirement plan? Half. We cannot let employers off the hook for their responsibility to help their employees save for retirement. Thank you. You know, retirement saving, the gap that exists in retirement savings is astounding when you look at minority workers. Um, black and Hispanic workers remain behind their white peers when it comes to planned participation and planned uh, retirement savings. The median retirement saving of white American workers was $1,000 in 2022. Median retirement savings for black families was 39,000 and for Hispanic families, 55,000. Moreover, the racial wealth gap expands even in retirement savings. Research has shown that the typical white household has five times more non-Social Security retirement uh, wealth in their household than the typical Hispanic household, which has 35,000, and seven times more than the typical black household, which has 24,300 as their median retirement savings. Mr. Reese, when we discuss retirement savings, is ESG the top priority uh, for the AFL-CIO workers? I bet access, access to retirement savings and eligibility are far more important to your workers. Can you discuss what workers, especially minority workers, are most important uh, when it comes to access and incentives and incentivizing um, retirement savings? Yes, ma'am. All working people, white, brown, black, deserve a secure retirement. The union difference in ensuring that working people can save for retirement and negotiate with their employers to have retirement plans uh, disproportionately has benefited workers of color who are union members. We're proud of that fact, and we will continue to fight for all working people, including the most disadvantaged workers in our society, to ensure that they, too, have access to a secure retirement. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back the rest of my time. Mr. Kustoff is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for convening today's hearing, and thank you to the witnesses for appearing today. If I could, Mr. Bollet, with, with you, uh, before I started serving in Congress before my election in 2016, I had the opportunity to serve on a community bank board, which experience that I really enjoyed. And I saw, when I was on the board, the enactment of, of Dodd-Frank, which had tremendous overreach on, on our bank, on the customers. In my opinion, it ultimately led to higher costs for those customers and decreased access to certain banking services. I could, in your opening statement, your opening statement that you gave and, and your written statement, you talked about the ESG mandates um, essentially being, I think you characterized as a one-size-fits-all regulation, uh, the government's efforts to steer ESG factors uh, and how that affects the bank. Can you talk about specifically, though, how those ESG mandates affect your bank customers? Any, thank you for that question, Congressman. Any direction to mandate to say that we have to loan to a certain customer because of their ESG policy or not their ESG policy is not something we would welcome. Uh, our board sets our policies on who we're going to, uh, what type of lending we're going to do. Again, Main Street has always been known for staying in your lane. And if our bank doesn't want to loan to oil and gas industry because we don't have the expertise, that's the way that should be our policy and our choice. Um, in our bank at home, we're particularly uh, heavy in ag lending, as I mentioned in my opening statement, because we feel we have an expertise in that area. There are some banks that don't have the expertise, and so again, they stay in their lane. And any direction from um, regulators or any type of mandate would help, would be detrimental to our bank. Thank you. You also talk about uh, your the area that you, the you uh, your bank serves. My congressional district, the 8th Congressional District of Tennessee, sounds somewhat like your district, uh, where 
ag plays a, a big part in, in my district in West Tennessee, certainly in your area. You talked about your family-owned farm. Can you talk about the challenges that ESG mandates presents to family-owned farms like yours to, to ranchers and farmers? You bet. Thank you for the question. Again, anytime you want to mandate a change or uh, drive a practice, there's unintended consequences. And those, especially in agriculture, if uh, an example to come say that we had to do all no-till uh, for all across America, that, that that's unsustainable. It doesn't work in all areas, and especially in our area, there's certain farms, um, ranches, soil types that, that can handle no-till, and across the country that wouldn't it wouldn't work, um, and especially, in not going to talk too much about your district, but I don't know that no-till would work in your district. It right. uh, depends on your climate and those things. So, again, any mandate would be detrimental to our production agriculture. Can you talk about the labor issues and the um, uh, maybe the labor complexities as it relates to ESG mandates as on your family farm or family farms in your area? Uh, our area is rural, and we, we want to hire anyone who can – to do the job. So it is tough to get uh, quality labor, uh, like most areas of production agriculture. Uh, finding that, we want to hire the best person for the job. Would these mandates raise the labor cost? Most definitely. Anytime you want to mandate something, it may not be uh, probable uh, for us to fit that mandate. So again, uh, having the option and the flexibility is what we, we would like to see in the production ag sector. Thank you, Mr. Billy. Mr. Isaac, thank you for appearing today as well. I uh, read your article that was posted on the Fox News website from earlier this year, I think February of this year. Uh, the, the column or the headline of the article was the real Chinese spies are attacking America from within. Can, can I ask you to talk about that and maybe specifically, maybe specifically, is China using the ESG movement and American savings to advance their own geopolitical interest? They are doing it to advance their own geopolitical interest. And what they're doing is they've built up and funded this network of financial institutions like the Climate Action 100 Plus, which is uh, part of uh, another one of these organizations that has you know, a vast majority of the assets under management under their umbrella. This, this organization meant to decarbonize the planet, which I, I showed and shared the numbers earlier of the benefit. There, there is no benefit, but there are extreme costs to do that. And I, I say that having drinking a carbonated beverage that contains more CO2 than what's in the atmosphere, and I assure you I'm not going to spontaneously combust. But they're, they're, do, they're pushing this ESG agenda within these financial asset managers. And you look at the debanking that has occurred with these companies. Coal was really the first thing. We're no longer going to make capital available to companies that are producing or earning their revenue from coal. And what's happened? Well, coal has decreased significantly in the United States to the detriment of our electric reliability. But you look globally last year, wasn't a minus 0.2% decrease like these ESG funds. It was a 9% increase in global consumption of coal. And guess where it's getting produced? In a place that doesn't care about human rights or the environment, China. It's not getting produced here in the United States that produces it and utilizes it more responsibly than anywhere else on the planet. And I say utilize it. And I, I say of all the technology the Chinese steal from us, it'd be nice they would utilize our pollution control technology. But they don't. And we do here in this country, we produce that electricity, again, more responsibly than anywhere else. I wish the rest of the world would at least meet air quality standards that improved the air quality rather than focusing on decarbonization, which is dangerous, deadly, and dumb and doesn't do anything to mitigate a changing climate. Thank you, Mr. Isaac. I yield back. Ms. Del Bene. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Um, I find it frustrating that Republicans will stop at nothing to play politics, and today is the politicization of pension plans. This hearing is an attempt to distract the American people from a looming shutdown um, and the constant chaos of the Republican majority. Now, many of us here work with our colleagues across the aisle on issues that are actually impacting Americans, like increasing affordable housing production, ensuring families had access to safe baby formula during the national shortage, and helping seniors obtain medical care without unnecessary delays due to prior authorization. 
Unfortunately, that is not what we're doing here today. The title of this hearing shows that Republicans aren't serious about crafting thoughtful retirement policy, protecting seniors, or helping low and moderate income people save for retirement. Um, earlier this year, I introduced the Freedom to Invest in a Sustainable Future Act, which would codify the Biden Labor Department's rule regarding ESG investments. Um, Ms. Rees, does the Biden Labor Department's rule require planned fiduciaries to invest retirement plan assets in ESG investments? No, ma'am. Thank you. Also, isn't it true that under the Biden rule, planned fiduciaries must always act in the best financial interest of participants and beneficiaries? Yes, ma'am. Um, and specifically, isn't it true that the Biden rule provides that in selecting plan investments, first and foremost, Planned fiduciaries must consider risk and return factors and not subordinate the, subordinate the interests of participants and beneficiaries to support secondary goals. Yes, ma'am. So, Mr. Rees, can you talk about what you see as political interference of the management of ret retirement plan assets? Um, or you talked about that, and I wondered if you could expand on that. Yes, ma'am. I want to address uh, an important issue uh, that retirement plans consider ESG factors both as an investment risk in selecting particular investments, but they also consider it when pro voting proxies. Our free enterprise system depends on share owners of companies deciding how businesses will address ESG risks. And that is the, the beauty of a free market system that investors can decide their views on ESG as the owners of the company. And I trust share owners to make those investment decisions. But the Republican bills that have been introduced would place limits on the ability to vote in the best interest of plan participants, instead encourage retirement plans to always vote with corporate CEOs. CEOs are not always right. The CEO's, CEO of Enron was not right. The CEO of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers were not right. And that's why we need to have shareholders have the ability to vote in the best interest of their pocketbooks. And retirement plans must be able to invest in the best interest of their plan participants that they owe a fiduciary duty of loyalty. These bills would encourage retirement plans to violate their fiduciary duties to vote in the interest of plan participants by always voting in the interest of corporate CEOs. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stubbe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The savings of everyday Americans are now a vehicle for radical environmentalists to exercise their political goals in the private financial sector because they can't achieve their autocratic tendencies through the means of government power. And the Biden administration is supportive of these efforts, implementing rules to allow woke investors to control American savings and vetoing congressional action that tried to stop it. The law is clear. Tax advantage retirement plans in both state government and the private sector must be managed for the exclusive benefit of beneficiaries. This means that retirement plan managers may not pursue non-financial goals in their investments. But based on analysis done by the staff of this committee of 15 of the largest global ESG funds totaling over $120 billion in assets, ESG-labeled investments had a net loss over the past year, 18 percentage points worse than the S&P 500 and 25 percentage points worse than the NASDAQ. Investment managers cannot prioritize politically partisan views over performing their legal obligations to provide security to American seniors and saviors, savers. Even though Joe Biden vetoed congressional action, we must continue to advance legislation in this committee and in the House of Representatives to curb this extremism that undermines the institutions of government and the financial security of everyday Americans. Florida did it this past legislative session. Uh, I would like to add, with, I'd like to ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to add a deeper look at Florida's anti-ESG legislation to the record, a Forbes article. With that objection, it's so ordered. I'm just gonna read one paragraph out of this. I encourage people to read it. It's a, it's a good uh, discussion about what Florida did, but this is just one paragraph. If I told you that the United Nations developed a plan to manipulate financial investments, to force businesses to enact environmental and social policies that align with their goals, announced by Al Gore, you would probably start pushing me into the conspiracy theory category. Yet it happened. It didn't happen in secret. There are no leaked documents or conspirators. It happened in public, through public meetings with clearly stated goals and outcomes, and they held a press conference to announce it. We just didn't know what they were talking about. 
So I'd like to add that to the record, and uh, I'll start with um, Mr. Oaks. And thank you all for being here today. I, I thought your, your responses have been excellent. Uh, Mr. Oaks, in your testimony, you note that the goal of ESG is not better financial performance, but rather to force compliance to a one-world view. Why are the proponents of ESG using these means to force their agenda on the American people? Well, I, I think it's pretty clear that these, uh, this agenda would not be accepted by the American people any other way. And so it's got to happen uh, in, the, in the private sector. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why this is so dangerous. We're, uh, we're going around bodies like this to implement policy that affects all Americans. And, and this, is, uh, this is dangerous to our, our constitutional form of government and our free market system. You also state that ESG policies po politicizes what should be purely financial decisions. Why is it so important that investment managers adhere to the exclusive benefit duty instead of these ESG considerations? Well, if you, th if you think about um, information, we talk about you know, investors wanting information. Information that's material to an investment decision is already uh, required disclosure. And so when we're pushing uh, companies to, to create reports or disclose uh, information, it costs money and resources on those companies. Um, spending resources on something that has no benefit is frankly irresponsible at best and certainly not in the shareholder's best interests. Many ESG proposals are not related um, to disclosing information, but rather uh, they want specific corporate action like uh, racial audits or net zero transition strategies. Uh, and oftentimes these disclosures give fodder to activists who then apply pressure to comply with the agenda and should, the, should this uh, disclosure show a company is not behaving according to that given agenda. So the information is often taken out of context to drive a narrative and shame a company to change its ways. Is a company giving to the right causes? Do they have a net zero plan so the targets can ratchet down as needed? Do they have racial equity, racial equity audits often drive the composition of the workforce independent of merit or competency? All of this information is used to drive compliance. And you also cite data showing a statistically significant negative relationship between ESG investing and investor returns. How does this tangibly affect American families? Well, clearly, this is not uh, about making money for people. There's another agenda at work, and that's why this is so problematic for all people. Uh, and, and in fact, if you look at, at uh, gasoline prices today and the chronic underinvestment in oil and gas that is leading to higher gas prices, it's really the low-income households that bear the burden of that because they spend three times more of their income on energy costs. And so this has a very detrimental effect on those who can least afford it. Agree with you 100%. Thank you for being here. I yield back. Ms. Chu. We are here today because the Republican majority would rather wage a pointless war, a culture war battle, than discuss policies that will actually protect Americans' retirement security. Let us be clear. The ability for plans to consider environmental, social, um, and governance or ESG factors in employee benefit plan investment decisions is not an actual threat to workers or retirees. This is a delusion made up in the minds of Republicans. The fact is, under the Biden administration's rule, ret retirement plans are simply permitted but not required to consider ESG factors when making investment decisions. Furthermore, the retirement plan managers impacted by this rule are fiduciaries, meaning that they are required by law to act in the best financial interests of plan beneficiaries, regardless of whether they are, are whether they're considering ESG factors at all. In reality, it is the Republicans' anti-ESG efforts that are presenting a real threat to Americans' retirement security. For example, Several Republican-led states are seeking to blacklist investment companies that consider ESG factors or even offer ESG fund options, banning their state pension systems from contracting with these employees and these companies. Firefighters, teachers, and other public service employees in these states have all raised concerns that this will harm their savings by limiting the pool of investment options available to pension funds. And as Mr. Reese testified, these types of state-level bans are as estimated to cost 
their public retirement systems and therefore taxpayers billions of dollars. This committee needs to turn its focus to helping and not hamstringing our nation's workers and their ability to achieve retirement income security. Now let me turn to a subject and talk of that a subject that actually does help Americans in retirement and that is secure 2.0. Mr. Reese Last Congress, this committee worked together on a bipartisan basis to pass the SECURE 2.0 Act, building on the success of the SECURE Act and helping more Americans save for a stable retirement. It is unfortunate that instead of thinking about how we can work together to benefit retirees and workers, our committee's time is spent on an issue outside of our jurisdiction and purely for political purposes. So I would like to instead talk about Secure 2.0 and specifically about a provision that I was proud to author which strengthened the savers credit into a more generous savers match. The savers match is now a fully refundable tax credit valued at 50% of retirement contributions for working class Americans. It directly helps the workers who don't earn enough to save for retirement while still making ends meet and putting food on the table for their families. Can you talk about how the savers match helps low income workers who might be left behind by the more traditional tax advantages for retirement savings? What are the, some, some of the ways that this committee can further help this group of workers save for retirement? Thank you for the question. Yes, the savers match uh, is critical to assist low wage workers who have not otherwise benefit from the tax code's provisions to save for retirement simply because their incomes are too low to benefit. And the savers match is a way to help better target those tax incentives to help low wage workers save for retirement. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, those same workers have the opportunity to save and that's why things like auto enrollment that help plan participation are important. That was also in the SECURE 2.0 Act. Uh, and we need to make sure that employers are contributing their fair share. And so I would urge the committee to look at also requiring automatic enrollment of employers who do not offer defined benefit plan to also provide a match to their employees saving for retirement. And Mr. Reese, you said that Social Security is the only retirement benefit low wage workers can count on. How will seniors be hurt if Congress cuts benefits? their retirement security will be decimated. 40% uh, of seniors rely solely on Social Security for their income. The average benefit is $22,000. Half of, of Social Security recipients' benefits are less than that. That is not a dignified retirement. Our country can and must do better to protect the retirement security of all working people, including low-wage workers in our economy. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Tenney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses uh, for being here today and discussing uh, environmental social governance. I know a lot of people don't know what ESG means in our listening audience, but we need to emphasize uh, that and, uh, under, for, and, and, and actually talking about how it's undermining uh, our long-term savings plans for many Americans. And I'm also grateful for the chairman for doing this because ESG is about politics. That's, the, that's why we're standing up for the American people against the politics that is being forced on us by the other side. And this is an urgent issue and one in which the House Republicans have rightfully sounded the alarm led by our chairman. ESG, I wanna keep saying it, environmental social governance, it is not about financial responsibility. It's a dangerous tool that is being used by the far left for years to force their own radical ideology on all Americans. It often comes at the expense of an organization's core mission in order to bring about unpopular political change. To nobody's surprise, this harmful tool has been also championed by the Biden administration. In 2022, the Biden administration issued new rules that retirement plan managers to have to prioritize environmental, social, governance factors over maximizing financial returns, their core mission under the statute originally uh, intended. This rule negatively impacts the retirement accounts of over 150 million Americans and puts their savings at risk. It pushes for ESG investing to become the standard at the expense 
or of providing a secure future for Americans. Even some Democrats recognize that this investment strategy is irresponsible. Senators Manchin and Senators Tester both spoke out against the Biden administration's rule and correctly point out that this rule will jeopardize the, the retirement security of all Americans. But the Biden administration clearly doesn't care and is willing to prioritize advancing far-left policies over Americans' retirement security. Unfortunately, this ESG trend, the envir environmental social governance trend, is running rampant at the state level too. In my home state of New York, officials in New York City have been pushing to exclude certain companies from pension funds, despite the negative impact on individual New Yorkers. In response, a New York City subway operator, a public school teacher, a school secretary, and occupational therapists are suing New York City pension managers for an unlawful decision to elevate unrelated policy goals over the financial health of the plans. The suit goes on to say that the actions of the New York City pension managers represented the culmination of a three-year pressure campaign mounted by public officials and other activists, and that in divesting, the trustees chose to withdraw indiscriminately all of their investments in any publicly traded fossil fuel security, a practice which has no basis in sound investment strategy, and that's a quote. The numbers around the country back this story up as well. Uh, during the past year, ESG investments have significantly underperformed the market as a whole. Aggregate returns on the top 20 largest ESG labeled funds were close to zero, while the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, went up 19% and 25%. This is, to Ms. Chu, talking about where they're going. People should be investing based on finances, not on the underperformance of ESG. And I just want to say thank you to all the witnesses for what they've done and what they've said. And I can just tell you, uh, when it comes to unions, and I just wanted to mention this to Mr. Rees, I used to represent Remington Arms, an iconic brand, one of the, one of the oldest manufacturers in our nation. Uh, they once had over 1,300 employees in my former district. They're now down to 200. And those are all good union jobs because of ESG and negative policies toward manufacturers of firearms, which are used by our military for shooting sports and for personal protection. And, and that, in, in that realm, that's caused problems. But I wanted to ask just Mr. Oaks quickly, because I know you've been combating this, you've been spending a lot of time on this. Uh, what do we do? Uh, what, how do we change this uh, strategy? And I come from a state where it's one party rule and mostly dominated by uh, negative uh, media when it comes to this. We have no you know, hydraulic fracturing among the best shale res reserves in the nation, yet we can't do that. How do we go about countering this and protect retirement security when these types of rules have been put in place? Uh, that's, that's a great question. I think the first thing is, is the continuation of lawsuits to protect the fiduciary standard in this country. That is incredibly important. Uh, the second thing is that, that people who are involved in the marketplace, each of us as consumers, need to have our voices heard when we see companies politicizing their business like we saw with Bud Light and Target that we don't patronize those businesses. Businesses are supposed to serve us as individuals, not some higher authority that's telling them what to do. And, and the third thing that I tell people is that we need to talk to our financial advisors and plan representatives and find out if our investment dollars are being used uh, politically. And, and if you think about uh, ESG, it's really a thumb on the scale. The anti-ESG, like what I'm trying to do, is get the thumb off of the scale so that uh, capital can go uh, be allocated efficiently like it is in a free market system. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess my time has expired. I yield back. Ms. Moore is recognized. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for this hearing. I want to thank all of the witnesses for being here. I, I, I just want to say before I start that uh, just the title of this hearing, um, you know, woke, attacking being woke. Well, I have sat here for two and a half hours, almost three hours, wide awake, and I am not going to be sleep, asleep on important issues like retirement security. Um, I am, I, I wish that we were using this time more productively considering that we're, that we've been up midnight 
one o'clock in the morning voting on crazy amendments that to prevent a shutdown. And if, if in fact, we were gonna sit here for three and a half hours, that we would really focus on those uh, retirement policies that would really make a difference uh, to people. Um, I, for example, um, I, um, you know, I think we did a great job with Secure and Secure Point Two and, and the Butch Lewis uh, Act, and of course, Secure and Secure and Secure 2.0 were bipartisan. Um, I think we've heard a lot of discussion here today about things that we really could do. Um, we've mentioned Social Security, for example, and I heard people sort of, you know, decrying the situation with illegal immigrants, but I guess I would ask you, Mr. Reese, do you think that immigration reform would increase the numbers of people who were not in the shadows and would, 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 would buoy our Social Security account as people paid into it? Do you think that, uh, do you agree with like the Congressional Budget Office that, that immigration you know, reform would actually help our financial position and our, our Social Security fund. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you for that. You know, I, I wish, for example, that we were, um, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about how we need to maximize the returns to investors. Um, would, would, it, would it help our economy if we were to maximize the ability of people to save? Like uh, Ms. Chu's uh, uh, comments about the, the savers match. Yes, Mr. Reese. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and increasing the minimum wage. Um, would it, in fact, I'm thinking now of the, our tribal communities um, uh, and how, and I am proposing legislation, and I hope, Mr. Chairman, that the Republicans will join in bringing more equity, and I'll get back to that, to, to this group uh, of folk. Um, you know, Native Americans are, a tribal governments are hampered to maintain government status under the current pension laws. The Indian tribal government must prove that it's performing essential government functions that are not commercial in nature. These limitations, would you agree, Mr. Reese, really forces tribes to split their pension plans into smaller, more costly plans to preserve, preserve their government uh, status and, in fact, are not using uh, of, of monies efficiently. Well, I'm not an expert on uh, tribal law, ma'am, but I would. No, I'm just talking about our current law. Okay, well, yes, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm gonna introduce it, Mr. Chairman, and we can, this is a better discussion and better, better use of our time. Um, Mr. Um, Oaks, I just wanna push back a little bit on your notion somehow uh, about, uh, you know, DEI, I heard you've talked a little bit about it. Equity uh, is not, when, when we talk, when those of us who are woke, when we talk about equity, we're not talking about equal outcomes, making sure that people have absolute equal outcomes. I'm just wondering if you think that the lack of diversity, the lack of inclusion, the lack, lack of equity in any ways has contributed to um, low wage workers, low income workers, people of color not being able to participate fully uh, in our economy. So I, I, again, I think it comes down to the definitions. How, how are those terms defined? Because some people will use those terms and they have different meanings to different people. In, in Chinese, there's a, a term called gai tong apgang. It's a chicken and a duck talking. And so when we don't have the same definitions, that tends to be what happens. Okay, well, okay. We're, we're not going to do the Chinese <laughs> today. I just want to say before I yield back um, that I... I do, t you know, my experience in this world is that you get better outcomes when you have diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we've seen that not just in our markets, but Mr. Reese, you might want to comment on how DEI has improved our economy, world, our, our economic and financial standing world, worldwide. Diversity, 
Diversity is a source of strength and a source of investment returns. Accessing all available pools of talent is incredibly important to have a productive workforce, and having diversity in the boardroom helps prevent group feet by having the same, same perspective uh, being overly represented. And so we strongly support uh, diversity, equity, inclusion in the boardroom and in the workforce. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Fishbach? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. I really do appreciate having this uh, important hearing to talk about America's uh, retirement plans. Um, but I, I will say it is baffling to me that this is even necessary um, it, it, because this is not about politics. This is about making sure that people have solid retirement funds. And that's what we're talking about. Um, retirement plans exist for a single purpose. I think we all know they're to provide financial assurance for working class people when they're too old to work, when they retire. Um, and Congress recognized the importance of investing in one's retirement, which is why it created the tax advantage plan to help people. Um, Mr. Reese, would you agree that the sole focus of retirement plans would be to provide the maximum financial return to the beneficiary? Yes, ma'am, I support the exclusive purpose rule for retirement plans. That's what we bargained for through collective bargaining with our employers. So you agree that their purpose is to make sure that they are making solid financial investments for the individuals when they retire? Yes, ma'am. That's in ERISA, which was passed the year I was born, 1974. Anyway, and, and Mr. Reese, with all due respect, I asked if that's what you think it is. I understand the law. Um, understand the statutes. Um, and I think Mr. Stubbe mentioned it, but um, just a reminder, the Ways and Means Committee staff did conduct an analysis of the 15 largest global ESG funds and found that it had underperformed the S&P 500 by 18 percent and the NASDAQ by 25 percent. So in cases where ESG investments do conflict with financial success, would you agree that it is irresponsible to prioritize ESG factors over financial success? Looking at a three-year window, for a retirement plan that's invested over a worker's uh, life expectancies, 30, 40, 50 years, is not appropriate to make investment decisions. I'll refer you to my written testimony where mm -hmm. I cite numerous st academic studies showing that consideration of ESG factors are value creating. Over 2,000 studies on this subject, 90% of them found that there was a a non-negative relationship between ESG and investment returns. The exact opposite of your contention, ma'am. Okay, but so, so where ESG investments do conflict with financial success, you would then agree that it would be irresponsible to prioritize ESG factors? It would be irresponsible for us to put our heads in the sand and, in, and ignore ESG risks to our portfolios, ma'am. So you mentioned your written testimony. And... Uh, that none of the multi-employer multi plans that receive tens of billions of dollars in taxpayer bailouts required special financial assistance because of ESG investing. You mentioned that. Um, if in the future multi-employer plans are put in jeopardy due to ESG investing, do you think that they should qualify for taxpayer subsidized bailouts? Ma'am, all I know is that Minnesota's 7th District, the district I believe you represent, Yes, sir. Uh, they, that there were over... 2,200 participants in the central states plan that receive $17 million in annual pension benefits. And the, the cost of uh, the Butch Lewis Act and that plan needing uh, financial assistance did not have anything to do with ESG. Well, and, and Mr. Reese, well, I appreciate all that. It's obvious you're not going to answer my questions, that you will not answer them directly. And um, it's just disappointing that we are not here to make sure that those retirement funds are all about returns for those folks in their in their golden years. Um, Ma'am, did you vote in favor of the Excuse me, Act? it's my time. I'm sorry. That's not generally what we do here, is interrupt. Um, but I, I, I will just say, I just, I am disappointed that not all of us are not focused on making sure that retirement funds that people are working for and investing in are focused solely on the financial return. Um, and that we should, all of us should be looking at that. And if ESG and it is interrupting that financial gain for people, we should be, we should not be 
focused on it. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to have a few minutes. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Mr. Moore is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate you holding this hearing today. It's very important. It's something that's very, uh, very much of interest to my home state uh, on these issues. And I'm pleased to have the Utah State's Treasurer, Mr. Marlow Oaks, here um, testifying to, before our committee today. More importantly, uh, your wife Elaine is also in attendance, which always helps your message land better. And we appreciate you making the trip. So. Uh, I'd like to submit for the record an April 2022 letter signed by Utah's entire federal delegation and its statewide elected leaders opposing the use of so-called ESG credit indicators that could adversely affect Utah's credit rating based on factors other than Utah's ability to repay debt. So ordered. Thank you. No objections. You. So ordered, Mr. Moore. Treasurer Oaks, considering uh, this will come as no surprise to my colleagues, I'm going to talk about Utah's strengths and how good we are in so many different facets. Uh, but considering Utah's strong economic performance and job creation, could you describe how ESG investment frameworks might negatively impact the entrepreneurial ecosystem, particularly for startups and small businesses that are actually thriving in our state? Yes, thank you for that question. So whereas Adam Smith, the 18th century moral philosopher, he spoke of an invisible hand as the driving force behind capital allocation, each citizen pursuing their own desires and interests, ESG represents an invisible fist of economic coercion. So I've spoken with executives of startups and small companies in Utah who have said that venture capital firms and large clients have asked them to complete long ESG questionnaires, including questions such as whether or not 60% or more of their board and staff are trans, LGBTQ+, or women. If certain demographic ratios are not met, the surveys then ask whether there are policies in place to terminate employees who are not in the protected classes until at least 50% of employees are in those classes within six months. Other questions ask about company benefit policies, efforts to monitor electricity usage monthly, assurance that renewable electric sources are used at an increasing amount each month, and policies to monitor airline travel to ensure employees are flying on aircraft with technology that is reducing the carbon footprint. Executives have expressed concerns about not having the resources to monitor these activities and wasting precious capital needed to grow the company for these kinds of activities. In some cases, small, smaller companies are forced to comply or lose business with larger companies. Quite simply, ESG represents economic coercion that harms businesses, individuals, investors, and markets. It's not good for anyone. Uh, Mr. Oaks, you and I, I would say we both understand the business community a little bit. I've, we've, we've both been in the private sector uh, with a lot of business leaders, uh, Utah leaders in general. Simple question, would you say that they need ESG to contribute to their community, to engage in social impact projects, to, to, to care for the, less, the most vulnerable? Do you, do you, would you say that Utah needs that? I, I would say that people in general, particularly in Utah, are concerned about other citizens and, and we really go out of our way to serve other people in our state and help other people and there's no need to force that on businesses that they have a they have a desire to help out um, and, and it, it you generally get better outcomes as we see with the state of Utah we have the highest volunteer uh, rate in in the country and and it's done uh, because people want to not because they're forced to yeah I'm sure everybody here has read I I was part of publishing something called the giving state in my previous career that's a joke I know you haven't read it <laughs> but it highlights that Utah has really focused on philanthropic causes. Most volunteer time, most volunteer dollars in per capita. It is a state that understands it, and it is led by primarily the private sector. Yeah. And the thing that I hear most from folks is, don't, don't, don't force us into these, into these particular outcomes. We're already doing the good work. Let us thrive. Let us, let, let us be able to continue to make these decisions. Um, when it comes down to, and this is something you communicate really well, the, just highlight for me with the last 20 seconds, any specific p potential risks of ESG-driven investment strategies that prioritize political agendas over shareholder value. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, as, been, as, as has been stated, I think companies need to focus on their business and providing the best good and service in the marketplace at the most competitive price. That is the benefit to society. That's, that leads to better uh, uh, economic outcomes. It leads to a, a growth in, in uh, living standards. And, and that's the value that business brings to uh, the world and the community. And, and the innovation that comes from our free market system is what allows us to address things like climate change. And that's, that's what we need. We need to have our free market system uh, independent of political agendas that are being pushed. And that's always something I've appreciated with your message. You talk about these things are good causes. Let's go about it the right way and let's go about it so people can make the freedom, have the freedom to choose how they want to address it. So thank you and I yield back. Mr. Kildee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for recognizing me. I, I will say that I'm disappointed that part of the tone of the hearing today has been uh, rather divisive. I prefer the efforts to work on uh, areas of mutual concern where we have some common ground. I'd like to raise an issue that I do think, um, at least in my time here in Congress, has caused us to work together across party lines. And it has to do with retirement security, the fact that people who work a career at a, at a decent job ought to be able to have a retirement that was promised to them. So the tossing around of sort of political catchphrases is kind of interesting, but I'd rather kind of get back to the work that we might be able to get done that help, help secure retirement. And I, I'd like to specifically address something we could do uh, here in Congress, we've already demonstrated, and that is to deal with uh, the 20,000 Delphi salaried retirees who had their retirement taken away from them. When GM filed bankruptcy during the Great Recession, the U.S. Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation uh, the PBGC, unfairly cut retirement benefits, some as much as 70% for people who work their whole lives with the expectation that, that that retirement was going to be there for them. And they planned as if it would be there for them. And as a result, lots and lots of people I represent, I know others on this committee represent as well, lost something that was promised to them. Uh, we've heard stories about uh, Delphi salaried retirees having financial and medical hardships as a result. Uh, these folks played by the rules, and they got the rug pulled out from under them. When the federal government rescued General Motors, they, the federal government itself let, let those families down, left them hanging, and that's wrong. And that's why the bipartisan legislation that I uh, have sponsored, the Susan Muffley Act, would right this wrong. It would make the difference up in those pension benefits that were expected to be earned by those retirees before GM went bankrupt in 2009. Some have asked why the Delphi salary retirees would deserve to have their pensions restored and not others who've had pensions lost. I understand that concern, but I will say this, there is a significant distinction. The government, the United States government, was the one who decided to cut those benefits, not creditors, not the bankruptcy judges, the U.S. government made that determination. And so it's the government's responsibility to make those individuals whole. And I know there are members on this committee on both sides of the aisle that share my concern. In fact, I know Mr. Kerry has been supportive of this legislation. Others have as well, because we know these are folks who worked hard, played by the rules, and should not have had that taken from them. And so I, I would ask um, Mr. Reese, I know the AFL-CIO, despite the fact that you don't represent these particular employees, support our legislation just because I think it's an important thing we could potentially agree on, I wonder if you might just take a minute or two to comment on the importance of that particular situation and what our legislation would do for those folks. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, the AFL-CIO is, is pleased to support the Susan Muffley Act that would restore the pensions of those salaried workers who played by, played by the rules and to reserve a secure retirement. And as you point out, they're not union members, they're largely management employees of Delphi. Uh, Delphi was able to shed its, its um, uh, pension obligations through the corporate bankruptcy code. And we strongly support reforming the corporate bankruptcy code to prevent employer misuse of it to shed those pension obligations. Pension plans need to be given higher priority in corporate bankruptcy to prevent these types of abuses. 
I thank you for that comment. I couldn't agree with you more. There's a, there's a fundamental difference between some obligations that a company may have. Uh, these are problems, no question about it, to vendors and other creditors. But a lifetime of work with the promise of a pension should be at the very top of the list when it comes to how these situations are discharged. And with the exception of the Delphi salary retirees, for the most part, even in this case, people had their promises kept, had those pensions protected. I represent these families. I know others on this panel do as well. And so while it may not be the specific subject of this hearing, if it relates to uh, the sanctity of a pension, the promise of a pension, a lifetime of work, Congress ought to be able to do what it can to protect that. I appreciate your comments on this. I appreciate the entire panel's participation today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, uh, Chairman Smith, for holding this, uh, this hearing. And there's um, plenty of complexity surrounding ESG and its impact on investment decisions. Obviously, today's hearing is focusing on seniors and their retirement savings. Uh, in my home state of Pennsylvania, we have one of the highest uh, aging populations uh, in the United States. Um, and obviously, it's, uh, this is a critical issue for them. My first question uh, for Mr. Rutledge, um, in your experience leading over 800 employee benefits professionals, um, how do you feel we can best balance the need to strengthen fiduciary standards for seniors while at the same time uh, ensuring our government does not overstep on the internal decision making of private companies? I think that the, um, the, the continued focus on maximizing the returns, with, given the risks that involved in the various choices, keeping in mind that when, when the pension plan trustees make investments, they're always making a choice among investments that are available at that time. And at that time, the investments might be, um, one might be better than the other, regardless of how it's labeled, they should always go with the best one. Um, I think the statute actually is fairly adequate. The exclusive purpose rule is, I believe, adequate. The exclusive benefit rule in the code is, I believe, adequate. I think one thing we want to go down a level would, that, you, that could help, and it's more of an oversight function, is to make sure the departments are auditing these issues properly. It's one thing to say that you, you must always put the uh, interests of the retirees first and the workers first in, their, in the investment of the fund, but it's another thing to go out and check up after they've made investments and see if that's actually what happened. So there's been talk about um, some of the ESG funds performing less well than people expected. Um, you don't do a hindsight 2020 on a pension fiduciary, but when you see things like that, there should be an auditor that can go in and look at the, look at the f investment and ask, all right, when you did make this decision, did you follow a fiduciary process, a prudent process? Um, Employers do need to know that, that, if they, that if they make mistakes in their process of deciding about the investment, they, they, will, they, will, they will have to perhaps answer for it. That will, that will help them focus more, more laser-like on making sure they're maximizing the risk-adjusted return, regardless of the investment choices they have. Thank you, Mr. Redlich. Um, Mr. Belay, uh, DOL obviously released their, uh, they released their fiduciary rule proposal now called the Retirement Security Rule. Um, what is your perspective, your sense on um, what the impact this proposal will have on uh, your ability to provide retirement services uh, to your customers? Thank you, Mr. Congressman, for that question. Um, it's our understanding the DOL rule is about 500 pages, and it just came out a few days ago, so it takes a while for us to come through, comb through it. Um, but for us, we are on the understanding that it does permit and not require um, us to look at those ESG factors. And as long as it stays that way, uh, just as the gentleman before me testified, we want to make sure that it does, they stay in their lane and it does not require, it just permits. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Feimstra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. I, I just appreciate you uh, holding this hearing. Um, I'm glad we've dug into how harmful these ideological uh, investment practice can, practices can be uh, to American uh, retirees. Uh, ESG encourages activism. Think about that. ESG, environment, social governance, encourages activism over financial security of American workers. 
If you think about today, American workers, this is probably one of the top things that are on their mind. Do they have enough for retirement? Do they have enough dollars for when they get older? And yet we're going down rabbit holes talking about what's good for society, what's good for the environment, and placating to a liberal ideology. But it doesn't only affect retirees. As Mr. Belay said and others pointed out, that these misguided investment practices also permeate every aspect of our economy, including, including agriculture. Meaning, a farmer or rancher would be put under the microscope if these SEC rules continue to go, they'd be put under a microscope by the federal government subject, subjecting them to new reporting requirements and creating new compliance burdens would jeopardize uh, privacy violations and create unnecessary liabilities. This would require farmers to actually report their emissions. This is so far outside the scope of the SEC that I, I just feel it's unbelievable. It's, it's appalling. But that's exactly what SEC, SEG does. Managers of retirement funds should be focused on financial security for their retirees. The SEC should be focused on protecting investors. And farmers and ranchers should be focused on feeding and fueling the world. SEG tells all of them that you should forget all this and focus on implementing these liberal, progressive climate and social agenda rules. So Mr. Bollet, you, you, hit, you hit on this in your testimony. As both a farmer and a banker, which I applaud, uh, we have similar backgrounds, can you talk about how the cost of a regulatory compliance like SEG would threaten farmers and potentially could really affect their bottom line? Could you explain that? You bet. Thank you, Congressman, for that question. And in reg regards to our farmers and our practices, we all know there's economies of scale. Um, there are large farmers, small farmers, medium-sized farmers, and whenever you implement or mandate a technology to say that you have to use uh, automatic row shutoff on a certain sprayer, uh, if you only have a no certain amount of acres to spread that over, that cost can be detrimental. And any attempt for us, the banking industry, to be those regulators of that is uh, absurd and really hard for us to do. We'd have to hire consultants to go out to make sure that all of our farmers were matching a specific ESG policy, which again, raise the cost of capital and raise the cost of food. You nailed it. I want to talk about that. When you think about improving access to credit for rural communities and rural farmers, is something I'm extremely focused on. I actually introduced the ACRE Act, uh, which would in, in improve and lower the cost of, of, of rates for farmers. How would these regulations, how could they result in higher costs of borrowing for, for rural farmers and rural producers? So could SEG actually increase the cost of borrowing? Thank you for that question, and yes, it could. Um, again, anytime you mandate more, uh, you know, we're a small bank, we have 225 million, we're you know, almost 35, 40% of our lending is in agriculture, and when you put those mandates on, for us to follow the governance part of it, we have to have more people, um, which in turn raises the cost of capital, and makes consumer goods more expensive. Yep. So it's twofold. So, so my in-laws are, are, are farmers. Uh, you know, the, my my dad-in-law and my brother-in-law farm. All right. So it affects not only their borrowing. All right, that will increase, but it also affects them by they have to start uh, uh, managing all these new aspects. I mean, it is just an absolute hit uh, to the breadbasket uh, of our nation. Uh, Mr. Oaks, uh, how often are employees aware that their retirement funds are being used for, to pursue pol a political agenda? Do you, you think most people are aware of this? Uh, no, because most of the time people don't have the ability to move their money. So it might be in a defined benefit plan, uh, in which case the plan administrator is, is overseeing those assets. They don't even often know what investment managers are being used, and even if they did, they don't have any input on what managers uh, can be used. And, you know, with the 401k, a plan uh, sponsor is going to hire uh, typically an investment firm, and they're going to offer their uh, plan, their, their uh, investment options in that plan. And so you don't have the ability to move outside of that. So it's really not an investor choice. Exactly. We're stomping on individuals. We're stomping on American producers. I'm, I'm ashamed that this is uh, going down this path. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Beyer. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. 
I want to first point out that it's ironic that in a discussion largely about so-called woke issues, that this is the least diverse panel I've seen in my nine years in Congress. Um, I, I, I love you, you're just like me, middle-aged white businessmen, um, but we don't represent all the American people. Um, second, I'd like to point out that, jumping on what my friend Mike Thompson said, in all of the community service work I've done, the incoming emails, 120,000 a year, not a single person has ever raised a woke retirement plan agenda to me. So I'm not quite sure what we're talking about. I also would like to, I, I love my friends on the other side. They're mostly um, really good people. I disagree with my friend, Dr. Drew Ferguson, though, who says that the only purpose of a business is to make profit. I've been in business 46 years, and we thought our part of our job was to serve the customer, to provide good uh, customer service, good products. Part of our job was to hire people who could then build their lives, buy homes, educate their children. I thought part of our job was to serve the community in the best possible way, to strengthen America. And that this notion that Milton Friedman capitalism was the only way to go forward doesn't match the values of almost any business person I know. I know my friend Kevin Hearn, who did very well with McDonald's, I'm sure he was not just about profit. Um, it's, it's important, you know, Edward Demme says the very first rule of business is to survive. Um, so you have to do that. And let me also just mention that um, my friend Mike Kelly talked about when you go home to Erie, Pennsylvania, people are still hurting. Yes, absolutely people are still hurting. Um, we have income inequality like we haven't seen in 100 years. Right now, we're, we're dead last in the G7 countries in income inequality. 69% of our wealth is controlled by exactly 10% of our population. 2.5% of our wealth is controlled by half of our population. It's never been that bad. Inflation has slowed, but prices are, got really high, and they're not going back. I often fantasize about what would happen if Donald Trump had won in 2020? What would my Republican friends have blamed the inflation on? This wasn't too much money chasing too few goods. It was enormous supply chain disruptions and a tripling of the profit margins of virtually every business. In the meantime, we have the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Bill, Chips and Science. Um, all these things are long-term investments. We had labor productivity jump to 4.7% last quarter, the highest probably in our lifetimes. We're at 4.9% GDP in the third quarter. Again, close to the highest in our lifetimes. The JOLTS job I looked up this morning, 9,553,000 jobs advertised. Um, again, a two to one ratio, which we've never seen before. But all these are long term, and it's going to take a while for people really to feel the benefits of it. So let me, Mr. Reese, I want to turn to you. Um, I was fascinated by the notion that um, in, a, in a debate about freedom, um, as a business person, I never wanted people to tell me how to invest my money. So why are we telling North Face and BlackRock and others? Carlisle, all these, I'm confused. I never thought BlackRock and Carlisle were, were the drivers of global socialism, as I'm hearing today. <laughs> um, how can this be? Why should we be telling them how to invest money that people are put in their care because they want to maximize their investment? Why isn't the freedom for let business leaders invest it as they think proper? Because my reading, word for word, from the, the uh, last thing is that, um, I don't know if I have it right in front of me. Uh, the 2022 AFL-CIO says, the rule clarifies retirement plan fiduciaries may consider, but are not required to consider, ESG factors just as they would consider any other investment factor. Mr. Reese. That's exa exactly right, that the uh, 2022 DOL ESG rule uh, protects the ability of retirement plan fiduciaries to consider ESG factors when they're material to investing uh, and I don't care if you're considering an investment in China or an investment that involves uh, uh, environmental sustainability or workers' rights concerns. Those factors matter for investment returns. And if you put blinders, if you tell retirement plan fiduciaries they have to stick their heads in the sand and ignore these ESG risks, you're doing a grave disservice to the retirement security of America's working families. It would be interesting to see, I just read that October was the warmest October uh, since we've been keeping records for many hundreds of years. Um, do you think it might be responsible for an investment manager to think about the downside cost to our environment and our economy of all the things that are coming from climate change? It would be imprudent not to consider those factors. Great. Thank you very much. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kerry, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the witnesses being here today. Uh, Mr. Rutledge, it's great to see you again, uh, your work with uh, the former senator from Utah and what we spent a lot of many hours talking about, coal miners' pensions and health care, and it's good to see you in this capacity again. Um, back in July 18th, the AFL-CIO uh, put out this statement, workers' retirement security is at risk as some Republican lawmakers play politics with working people's pension plans. By restricting consideration of environmental social governance risks in investment and proxy voting decisions, these partisan politicians seek to control trillions of dollars in workers' pensions investments. Now, I don't really think that's true, but let me just go on. If you're looking at overall, um, I think, Mr. Reese, you're organization also represents the United Mine Workers of America. Am I correct with that? That's right. My great-grandfather was a mine worker. Well, that's good. God love him. Which includes, obviously, all the coal miners, but there's a lot of other unions that have an association with the fossil fuel industry, whether it's operating engineers, steel workers, what, what have you. ESG investing, in many ways, is hurting some of these industries and, in turn, hurting many of the companies that actually employ those workers on a daily basis. And as, as Chairman Smith highlighted earlier, uh, and the staff analysis showed that the 15 of the largest global ESG funds have had a net loss over the past year and were 18 percent, percent points worse than the S&P 500 and 25 points uh, worse than the NASDAQ. So, NASDAQ. So given those numbers, how are you going to protect the pensions of these workers in the industries that ESG rules are actually targeting to eliminate. I disagree with your premise. I believe that investors need to be considering risks related to providing a just transition for working people in the energy sector to ensure that they have the opportunity to continue in the clean energy sector in good union jobs. Interesting. Um, you know, I think the other thing that we have to look at is in the financial sector, we've also looked at what has happened to our oil and gas industry. Um, and I know that we are rushing to a lot of these renewable energies and in, in the, in the technology and in the building of these. But meanwhile, we have to put into context that many of the supply chain uh, pieces and parts that are going into the renewable energy markets are actually coming from China. And if for cobalt, for example, 15 out of the 17 mines are actually owned by Chinese companies. And every renewable energy has to have part of that. So I guess the biggest thing I also want to point out is that while we're rushing to this, these clean energy jobs, most of which are in China, um, China is still relying mainly on coal-fired power. And I think this is a number that I don't, I know Mr. Isaac understands this number, but coal-fired power in China in 2022 was six times as large as the rest of the world combined, the new, the new coal-fired power plants. So while we are rushing to, to the new Green Deal and, and to ESG and all of this stuff, China understands that reliable power is going to be based on baseload power, which is going to come from fossil energy. So Mr. Isaac, can you describe the long-term ramifications on the oil and gas industry if ESG investing continues? And how would it be more prevalent? I think the greatest threat that we face is deindustrialization, and we're staring down that path right now by walking down this green agenda. It's happened in Germany. They they are they're, 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 the, inter, the German word is inter, translates to energy turnaround. They're now turning around their energy turnaround because it's been an abject failure. The largest manufacturer for BMW, a German automobile manufacturer, the largest manufacturing facility is here in the United States because we have affordable, reliable electricity. That's, and it's this deindustrialization has impacted Germany because they've embraced this just transition. It hasn't been so just for the people of Germany. It hasn't been so just for the people of the United Kingdom. The jobs are shifting to China. They're shifting to South Africa where you have kids from four and 13 working in these Chinese owned and controlled mines. 40,000 children today producing this just transition in the materials that are needed for it. Um, I, this has been a great panel, and uh, I, I, th I thank the chairman, and I want to thank the ranking member for allowing this panel to, and appreciate all of your time today. With that, we are voting, so I yield back. Mr. Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member. 
want to take this opportunity to have a real discussion about retirement. Mr. Right Evans, answer. could you put on the mic? I don't think it's working. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. I want this opportunity to have a real discussion about retirement security in this country, a topic that is critical to every citizen of this nation, including citizens in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. Mr. Reeves, how has the AFL and your role brought about awareness to workers about the importance of retirement savings, and how can the Congress help workers, particularly young workers, start preparing the retirement early in their careers? Thank you for the question. Negotiating for retirement benefit plans is a key priority for union workers whenever they seek to negotiate for fair wages and benefits. And the union advantage is undeniable for retirement security, that union members are over 95% likely to have a retirement plan through their employer negotiated by coming together in a union compared with less than half of all working Americans having that same opportunity to save. If we want to strengthen the ability of working people to save for retirement, Congress needs to pass the Protecting the Right to Organize or PRO Act. We know that Social Security is a particularly important source of income for groups with low income and less opportunity to save for retirement. In fact, more than 100,000 live in my, my district who rely on their Social Security to benefit. Mr. Rees, how can Congress strengthen the long-term stability of Social Security so that benefits are expanded? And that would be the impact on my constituents if their Social Security was to be cut out. Very simply, we can strengthen Social Security by expanding benefits and lifting the cap on Social Security FICA taxes uh, to include all income that high earners receive. Corporate CEOs should pay the same effective tax rate that working people do to Social Security. And by lifting the cap, we can restore solvency to protect Social Security for the future. I thank you and yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Panetta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A gentleman, thanks you for your patience today. I, I think we can all agree that retirement security is an important topic for all workers, especially as American workers have fewer traditional pensions, retirees are living longer, and Social Security is headed towards insolvency. Now, I am proud that this committee has worked in a bipartisan fashion to help workers save for retirement by passing both Secure and Secure 2.0. We actually found ways to make it easier and simpler to open retirement accounts to help workers save money in the long term, and we boosted participation in retirement savings programs, which will benefit both low-wage workers and middle-income savers. Today, however, I'm doubtful that we're truly focused on savers, and instead we're focused on unnecessary slogans by focusing on plans that very few invest in. As we've heard over and over, only 4% of plans even offer ESG funds as a plan option. Moreover, the focus of today's hearing suggests, suggests that money-losing ESG, ESG plans are being forced into unwitting middle-class savers, but it seems that this simply is not the reality. And we know the current administration put into place a revised ESG rule that allows for ESG investing options but does not mandate it, and it provides a clear roadmap for those who want to provide ESG options as part of the fiduciary process. So while I do believe that we can tighten up Stanford standards for what is considered an ESG fund, what is most important is that we continue to ensure that our working class families can save for a lifetime. Now, Mr. Reese, in your testimony, you suggest that, and I quote, proper stewardship of retirement savings requires the freedom to consider all relevant investment considerations, including ESG risks, unquote. Why do you believe that the option for ESG considerations helps not harms workers? ESG factors are relevant to any investment decision, whether or not you call yourself an ESG fund. 
and this is particularly important when it comes to proxy voting. Uh, corporations hold annual meetings in which the share owners of the company have the opportunity to decide how to vote on important matters, the election of directors, the executive compensation of the CEO, the auditor, and shareholder resolutions addressing ESG topics. And the Republican bills that have been introduced would create a safe harbor to discourage retirement plans from having their voices heard through proxy voting by either abstaining from voting or by always voting with corporate CEOs. Uh, and that violates the duty of loyalty. Abstaining from voting gives your vote to other share owners who are voting. Voting always with corporate management violates your fiduciary duty because corporate management is not always right. Ask the share owners of Enron and WorldCom, ask the share owners of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Okay, thank they you. They would agree. Thank you. Mr. Rutledge, you noted in your testimony that the Biden Department of Labor determined that the 2020 ESG rule created uncertainty and was discouraging fiduciaries from considering climate change and other ESG factors in investment decisions. And you said, and I quote, even in cases where it was in the financial interest of plans to take such considerations into account, unquote. Do you agree with the Department of Labor that taking into account ESG considerations could be consistent with acting in the client's best interest? Yes, I, <clears throat> yes, I do. Uh, but I, I don't agree that the Trump rule, uh, that I think the Biden administration was wrong that the Trump rule um, ma made it harder. I think the thing about the Trump rule that concerned people, and I'm not, and it, I don't think it was fair, was their decision to use this term pecuniary and non-pecuniary. It was a new word, a new term. People kind of couldn't get past it, but if you look at the way the Trump rule defined pecuniary, it was straightforward. It means um, focusing on factors that are material to the economic performance of the investment. It's what the Supreme Court requires. It's what that rule required, and it was an attempt to tether the rule to some fixed law, Supreme Court cases, and maybe stop the ping pong. It didn't stop the ping pong, but at least we're now in the world where it's notice and comment rulemaking, and the, 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 you know, the, the commenters, uh, the, the agency does have to take in public comment. So I'm proud about that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I'd like to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. Please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Good job. Long day. Yeah.